Suave. I've been in my bag for a while, I'm invincible Story of a young boss, grinding shit critical Calling on my bros one time, cause you special I had some hood dreams and right rounds for my mentor Every target that I shoot is on point like a pencil Different routes change relationships, I'm so sorry Came up from the trenches and I made it, I say hardly now Bet Online is your number one source for all of your betting needs Get the latest odds, lines, and matchup reports for baseball, boxing, golf, and more Bet online continues to be the fastest and easiest way to place your wagers, including live betting and your favorite casino and card games available to play right from your phone. Head to the website or use your mobile device to sign up today and get in on the action. Remember to use promo code BELIEVE, that's B-L-E-A-V, for your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet online, where the game starts. All righty, guys, we are back with another episode of the What's in Your Bag podcast presented by Bet Online. I'm your host, Andrew Robinson. And uh, before we introduce today's guest, you know what I'm saying? We got a special, special guest today. Uh, one of my favorite people that I've been able to meet over the last year. You know what I'm saying? So we're going to intro him in a second. But before we get to that, we got to get the business out of the way. Folks, if you're watching this on YouTube, go ahead and stop what you're doing right now and tap that subscribe button. Give us a thumbs up. It goes a long way. Uh, we're Going full force into our creator series right now. And like I said, I've got one of my favorite creators on the podcast today. Obviously, if you're watching this, then you already know that. So go ahead and subscribe so you don't miss any more interviews just like this one. That was my guy, Pull Up Tay, on the intro, one of the hottest up and coming artists out of the DMV. One of the hottest, like I said, one of the hottest up and coming artists out of the DMV. Just dropped the uh, project, Heartbreaks and Melody. So make sure you guys go ahead and stream that. It's going to be him again on the outro. Um, my guy's putting out hits, man. But like I said, we are full force into our creator series. And this is a guy I actually had the pleasure of meeting out in LA when I was out there kicking it with my brother out in Clipperland. I know some folks might say it's Lakerland, you know what I'm saying? But I got to show a little to my twin brother, you know what I'm saying? Clipperland out there in LA. Um, this is somebody who's does who does amazing work uh, in the NBA photography landscape. He's probably shot some of your favorite photos, you know what I'm saying, already, but we are pleased to be joined on the creator series by none other than Be Like Mike. Mike, my guy, <laughs> what's up? Uh, what's up, bro? That's a that's a hell of an intro, man. Thank you. Thank you for having me on the pod, bro. I really, I really appreciate it. No doubt, man. No doubt. We, we, we were trying to get this in the works for a little while now, man. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy that we're finally able to get it done. Like I said, man, you you taking some of my favorite photos of the year. I know if you're watching this and the folks would, would agree, man. So we're going to get into all that. You know, we're going to get into your, your photography journey your playing journey. Obviously, my guy's still dropping buckets off, by the way, but like I said, we're going to get to that in a little bit. We'll get to that in a little bit. Um, but uh, for now, though, man, what's 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 the offseason like, man? I mean, obviously, I feel like shooting the NBA, for my mind, uh, I feel like the NBA is obviously a crazy grind. But I remember when I first tried to tap in with you when the season was over, you was like, yo, bro, the offseason low-key crazier than the season. <laughs> so you're talking yeah, about what bro. the summer's been like for you. Man, so for me, the summer – in general, bro, like, as, as you know, bro, being a basketball player, like, in season is, I don't want to say it's easy, but it's easier because the off season, there just, there's, there's a different level of demand that's put on the body and the mind because now you're basically a, a blank canvas going into two to, two to four months of training, depending on where you're playing. Um, and as a creator, content creator, whatever you want to call it, photographer just I see myself as just a creative I don't want to say I create content because I like to create things that kind of have a deeper meaning that aren't just like just photos like there are right. levels and layers to the photos that I try and take at least um but knowing that with the summer being on the table it's like you know you're going to be in the gym you're going to be shooting workouts you're going to be shooting open runs and then again, being in LA, you have the Drew, like one of the best pro-ams on the planet. And LA, obviously being LA, a lot of pros like to be out here because you get everything, like the weather, <laughs> the people, the culture. And again, with top tier guys, a lot of their agencies are based out here. A lot of their media stuff is done out here. So there's a, a heavy influx of, of players, high level players, in the city. So in the summer, it's busy because everybody is everywhere. And if you have the chance to shoot people, like you gotta, you gotta be on the move. And so that's why, like, again, when we were talking, man, I didn't know where I was going to end up. 
and what I was going to be doing just because, again, this is only my second, I'd say this is, yeah, my second summer shooting and covering like the NBA basketball side of things. And I know last year things kind of went from zero to 100. So I really didn't know what to expect. And it has been busy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Sheesh, man. Now, I, I can only imagine, man. So speaking of which, uh, we've been peeping the grand. I see you've been, you know, shooting some open gyms. You've been at Rico Hines running. I just saw you photograph, you know, Clay Thompson uh, up at LMU and a bunch of guys, Stanley Johnson in the in the pro runs. Um, what's been some of the craziest plays or things that you've seen at some of these runs? Is there any plays that sticks out or just watching some guys and be like, damn, like, you know, this guy is really special. Obviously, you know, NBA guys, when they pick, when they play pickup, you know, these guys are the best players in the world. But I feel like sometimes when you get to watch them outside of elements, like, damn, like, this is really, these dudes are really on another level. Do you have any moments like that that kind of stick out? And uh, the first, the first person to pop into my head, because in all honesty, like every, every run he does something crazy is KJ, uh, KJ Martin, like mm -hmm. guaranteed. I mean, obviously if you tap into the ball is life, like Rico, like the Rico runs, like almost every week, every day, KJ does something that just doesn't make sense <laughs> from like an athleticism standpoint. Like I, there's a, a dunk he had last year that I missed the photo, which is funny because people always say, oh, you don't miss this. And the they, they say photographers don't miss, but bro, we miss. Y'all yeah. just don't see the misses. <laughs> but this dude put somebody in the basket so bad it was crazy. Like there was a photo that I caught actually of, uh, I want to say it was his agent at the time, Cassie Athena, uh, my guy Brandon, uh, Brandon Ball is life. Then a bunch of players kind of crowded around looking at the footage of the dunk because it was that it was that wild. So he's definitely one that stands out. Um, also uh, holding it down for the overseas guys. Uh, Kevin, Kevin Punter was with, mm. uh, with Partizan. Partizan, like Partizan yep. Bro, there are few people on the planet that can score the ball as effortlessly as he can on a consistent basis. And again, being at this point, being a former Hooper, like I, I feel like I have a different level of understanding of the game than many photographers. But that dude is, I mean, obviously he's, he's playing overseas, but he's, he's an NBA player, in my opinion. Yeah. He's, yeah. His skill set is up there. Um, other than those two, I mean, I can run down the list, bro. I haven't seen Steph last year, Clay this year, uh, Trey Young um i'm just trying to think because at this point bro there's just there's just so many names and i'm not trying to be the name dropping guy you know what i'm saying but right. like these dudes are unreal let's just put it let's put it that way like they're yeah. absolutely unreal and there's a reason that especially like the the top 25 to 30 people on this planet like there's a reason that they are as good as they are because some of the stuff that they do on the court is just it's it's unreal. It's unreal to say the least. Thanks, thanks. When I'm glad you brought up Kevin Punter, man, because for the folks listening to this, you know, this is obviously um, folks are probably going to be tapping into this who are NBA fans. Kevin Punter is one of the best players, probably in Europe. Him, Mike James, comes to mind. There's a bunch of guys that are that are on that list. Will Clyburn. Um, what kind of player do you think Kevin Punter would be if he came to the NBA? Because, like you mentioned, I mean, he's a great you know scorer, and obviously, I, I do think he could play in the NBA. Um, how would you, if, if there's a guy in the NBA that you would compare his game to for people who maybe aren't familiar with or kind of like, you know, a role that you could see him fitting into, what would that be? Low key, uh, I want to say Jamal Crawford. Mm. That's where my mind goes. Uh, just mm. because I feel like, obviously, Jamal, ball on a string, effortless scorer, six man of the year, how many times? <laughs> I, I can't Counts. recall. But in my opinion, Jamal is a Hall of Famer. I hope he gets there. Super nice. Um, but that's that's the first person to kind of pop into, into mind. But I also could totally understand why Kevin might not make that jump mm. because to a certain extent, that's not guaranteed. Whereas sure. at the end of the day, like when, I mean, not to count people's pockets, but they put out what his contract is. That, that man is getting paid and he deserves <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Thanks. Like he deserves every penny that he's getting because he has that game. So it's like he's essentially getting NBA money to a certain extent. Yeah. And 
he has the opportunity to play and to really play and to be the guy. And at the end of the day, people, everyone really wants to be that guy or not everyone, but a lot of people want to be that guy. And he has the opportunity to do so and he's proven himself. So right. I could totally understand why he wouldn't want to come to the States and who knows how things could go. You know what I'm saying? You never know. You never know what a situation is going to be until you kind of play it out. But I could absolutely see why he would stay in Europe because I mean, he's, he's a legend. <laughs> like the bro is, the bro is a legend. he's a legend. And another person that comes to mind kind of along that same thought process is uh, Eric McCollum. Oh, um, facts. CJ's, uh, CJ's older brother at one point, bro, led the world in like the planet in scoring. I, I forget what the numbers were, but he was in China and cooked up. Like you could run down the list. There's so many, so many high, high level, high talented guys that could have touched the league, could have came over, could have been rotation players, but instead they decided to kind of, you know, take a different path and obviously they've made a great great living for themselves and it can't be not because at the end of the day like those who know know and that respect is definitely there especially from from peers like the average fan might not know but hoopers like we we know <laughs> we 100%. really really 100 <laughs> percent Man, those were some great shouts. Those were some great shouts this game for sure, man. I'm, 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 I appreciate that. You know what I'm saying? The overseas hooper need appreciates that for sure, man. Um, now before we kind of get into your journey, man, you know the 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 last question I gotta ask in regards to summer hoops is, you know, the Drew League <laughs> performance this year. Talk about just, um, and I was like I said, we're gonna get into your journey, kind of how this this came full circle. But just how did it feel just getting back out there hooping? You know what I'm saying? Again, and not only hooping, but like my boy put up a dove ski out there. You know what I'm saying? So playing, playing well. Like, I, man, listen, listen, real, real talk. Like, it's tough once you stop hooping to be able to get back out there with pros or high level competition, like you mentioned at the Drew League, and actually perform. And they ain't sweet. You got to be able to really stay in shape and still move around and not embarrass yourself. So talking about how, how, how it felt getting back out there, man, and just how rewarding that was to just kind of have that ball in your hand and be able to play well again. Man, so, bro, it was, it was crazy on so many levels because prior to that, it had been two years since I had played, like, a, a real game, like, on a real regulation court. Um, like, I finished my last season playing professionally. I was in Japan. Uh, that was 2021. And I mean, I'm not going to touch too much on that yet. We'll probably get into that uh, sure. as far as like the journey aspect. But I pretty much, I put the ball down and I obviously I ended up picking up a camera. And so my focus was more so on career and trying to build and get a name for myself as a photographer. But I still would be in the gym uh, just staying in shape, not necessarily working out like on hoop stuff, but just doing cardio lifts like more so for my mental health than anything else. Mm. And so I just knew like I was on a baseline level of just being in decent shape. I'm not right. in playing shape, like real playing, like my real playing shape, I'm nowhere near that, which is why right. like, like there's certain runs, certain, certain places, like I'm not, I don't play basketball anymore and I'm aware, right. like I know right. myself. Like, so like when people ask, oh, like you play this, I'm like, I am retired because I'm very much retired. Because again, right. as pros know, like there's a certain pace and a certain speed that the game moves at that level. And if you're not in shape, honestly, in five, six minutes, you suck in wind and you need to sit down. <laughs> so Thanks. anyway, fast forward to the, so to the Drew, um, again, being like a bro, like a 10 year vet, like I put in so much reps, so much time just in developing like my game that I, I kind of went into it confident but not arrogant because to me, like, to me, you get your confidence from the work that you put in and the reps that you, you know what I'm saying? Like the day to day. Grind. And when you don't, to me, when you don't grind like that, shouldn't be talking. <laughs> you shouldn't be talking because you're not putting in the work to, to essentially earn the ability to speak. Obviously there, there are people who have put the work in, in the past, like you don't lose it per se. But for me, like, I wasn't going to go in thinking like, oh, I'm going to fry this. Because again, I have so much respect for the actual process mm -hmm. and the day-to-day -day grind and the day-to-day -day work that professionals really put in. And I mean, to me, that's, that's what separates like the pro from, 
the amateur because like your life is in the gym. Like everything revolves to a certain extent around your workouts, your lifts, all that. At least that's that's my thought process. Right. Um, but man, I'd worked out maybe two or three times during the week. My jumper was feeling good because I mean, I can't lie to you. My jumper is never going to leave me. Like my legs might, <laughs> leave me, but like my mechanics at this point, bro, they've been just drilled into my head. Like they're not going anywhere. Right. Um, the handle is a completely different story. Your handle goes quick. That's the first thing to go. But anyway, going into the game, man, like it was, it was just funny because for the last two years, I've been on the other side of the camera, just in general for the last, however long I've been actually shooting basketball. It's just observing and watching is totally different than doing. And at this point too, like I have a bunch of friends now in the media space and I've kept it relatively quiet with some that I like played professionally because mm -hmm. it doesn't matter anymore. I'm not currently doing it. Like I don't have an ego like that at all. Right. So like I told a few people I was going to play like, and it was just, it was just a big joke and game time comes like, I'm out there just going through my warmups and it's just, it's weird to be back on the court, but obviously like that's, that's my first love, bro. Like truly, truly my first love. And like, I had no, I had zero expectations. i truly was just happy to have a, a Jersey on again because it had been that long and I didn't start, which was cool. Cause again, I respect the process, bro. Like I don't work out like that anymore. Like there's a whole nother like generation below me, like age wise, like they need to Thanks. get their work. They need to get their run. Then their dudes who are still doing this for their livelihoods. Like I'm not, I'm just out here literally for fun. Right. And I'm aware yeah. of like the, the pecking order because like I've been on the other side. So like, there's just a certain level of respect that's given, but anyway, game starts. I'm on the bench. Like I tried to kind of go through like my old routine when I used to play, but it's also tough because the drew you have four minutes to warm up before the game. So mm -hmm. there really is no anything. Um, but anyway, I got thrown in, um, in like the, the last bit of the rotation. So like three minutes left in the first, uh, Keon, shout out to Keon Kindred. One of the, the realest, the realest folks in LA, the gatekeeper, like dude is legend in his own right. But he let me hop on to begin with. So, oh, shit, rewind. Oh, can I cuss on this? My fault. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You good, bro. You good, bro. <laughs> <laughs> but so, so rewind, bro. Like, I had uh, tapped in with Keys maybe like two weeks before just to catch up because, like, he's like the big bro. Um, went down to his gym. Guys were in there working out. We were just talking. I just, like, jokingly floated the idea, like, yo, can I hoop in the Drew? You know, like, I want to play whatever. And he's like, ah, oh, yeah, you know what? Pull up. Cool. So then I actually texted him a week later to like follow, follow up on it. And he was like, nah, nah I don't know. I don't know if, you know, if we gonna have room on the team, et cetera. And I'm like, all right, man, cool. So long story short, he ended up texting me back and told me to pull up. And again, like I'm playing with redemption, which is a team that's uh, relatively laden with vets. And for me at this point in my at this point in my non-existent career, because I'm retired, throw me with some vets that know how to play the game and it's light because you just play the right way. Right. So anyway, fast forward now, I'm getting back to being thrown into the game. Three minutes left. Uh, the ball is in my hand. And again, like I've played in the Drew. This would be like year seven, maybe. So like there are folks in there that know me. Mm. um the announcer like knows me it's like it's like damn like welcome back to a certain extent then there are also people who have no idea that I ever played basketball and right. think I'm just a photographer which is comedy in its own right so right <laughs> I get the ball bro on the left wing first touch um ironically like one of the homies was guarding me his name is Van Van Gerard super talented very good defender like the ultimate glue guy and I'd actually, I'd shot some stuff for one of his AU teams earlier in the year. Like we had been joking around cause he plays for cheaters. And I was like, yo, mm -hmm. if y'all ever need a shooter, you know what I'm saying? Like hit me, like I'll pull up Thanks. and it was all, all love, whatever. So anyway, first touch coming up the left wing, he's guarding me. <laughs> and I just, I basically just attack him, kind of get him on his heels a little bit. Has he pull 
cash. And I'm like, oh, shit. I still, <laughs> I still, still there. <laughs> like, it's still there, right? And man is like dying laughing. He's like, damn, bro, like that? That's how you feel? And I'm like, man, whatever. I'm kind of just rolling with it. And my thing too is, especially as I've gotten older, like I kind of just let let the game come to me instead of like pressing for it. And yeah. this game, bro, it just came to me in all the right places. Um, I end up getting some open threes, getting to my mid range, pick and roll stuff. Next thing you know, I mean, we ended up losing the game. We got cheated though by the cheaters. Ironically, is just what happens. Kudos to them. Another shit. Another living legend as far as like the overseas life. Uh, Casper Ware, like he mm. touched the league with the Sixers, but he's another one that's just unrealistically talented like it's yep. it's unreal especially being an undersized guard like he managed to get to the l max bucket at Big 5 bucket. 10 you know what i'm saying at 5 10 like the dude's level of skill is off the chart and he's playing for a uh, seska moscow like another high high level guy but long story short we lost to them but from a personal like on a personal level i won because after not playing a game for two years i dropped 22 and three an efficient 22 and three, man, it just, it felt so nice to be back on the court because man, like I, I spent so much time, so much of my life, bro, just dedicating it to basketball, to developing my craft as a player. Yeah. Um, so to still be able to kind of tap into that while being on the media side now is, is fantastic. And it was, it, it was a really good feeling because like, I'd heard some chatter, like people be talking shit, you know, like, oh, he never really hooped this, that, blah, blah, blah. Like, okay. And now, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? To a certain extent, like, all right, y'all, relax. Yep. That, I, I'd be lying if I didn't say that that was, uh, that was a huge motivating factor as to why I decided just to hop on the court again. Because mm. I don't think there is another... I don't think there's another me in the sense of somebody who played at the level that I played at that is on the media side and is behind the lens mm. so it, it felt really nice to kind of hold it down for the the camera folks out there um, and, and let people know that you know we could do more than just click the shutter hey listen man that's that's facts right there y'all better put some respect on my boy name y'all have to get caught on that island in the drew you know what i'm saying I'm, wa up. I'm washed dog i'm washed <laughs> i'm washed it was a good day <laughs> I just have to remind people, but I am, bro, I'm happily washed. And if anything, man, it's, it's truly a pleasure now to be able to see just what some of like the, the young folks are doing now on the court, man. And I mean, I'm not that old, so I feel crazy calling folks young folks, but <laughs> it, it's just dope to see the way the game is kind of progressing and stuff. hundred percent, hundred percent, man. So kind of changing the gears a little bit, man. I want to get into your journey, right? Like just kind of, First, as as Mike the Hooper, right? Not the, the photographer. So for you know me, I'm a DMV guy, right? So I feel like the DMV, we got the best hoops in the in the in the world. You know what I'm saying? Kevin Durant, we got you know Mike Beasley. You know what I'm saying? So we, I, I can go on alone, man, but that's not what this podcast is for. Regardless, though, in DMV, you know the ball gets put in your hand kind of early, right? My older brother Absolutely. Billy Edlin, um played at Syracuse with Melo, won national championship. So I remember I grew up watching him. In the championship game, it was like, yo, I'm, I'm playing basketball. You know, that, that was it for me. So for you, just talk about your upbringing, um, how you kind of got introduced to the game, and just, you know, what those first moments were like just kind of growing up. Man, um, introduction to the game, shout out to, to my mom. My mom was, or not was, she is huge, huge basketball fan. To the point that when I was born <laughs> – when I was born, obviously my name is Michael. My mom wanted my name to be spelled the way Clay Thompson's dad is. So Michael Thompson with a Y mm -hmm. instead of an I. That's how much like my mom, like Lakers basketball, all for it. Um, so obviously when when I got older, being older, like maybe five, six, like basketball would always be on TV at the time. Like my personal GOAT, the best player to ever play basketball from a skill standpoint is Michael Jordan. Watching oh, him play is what inspired me. That's why I said my go. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. Respect. <laughs> Respect. <laughs> Watching him play the game, bro, is what really made me kind of fall in love with it. Mm. And just by chance, too, 
Kobe happened to be coming up at the time as well. So seeing Mike and seeing Kobe, that just really like fueled my fire to to want to be good. And I feel like I was more of a late bloomer than anything else, uh, just because like I, ended up, I went to Crossroads, uh, the Crossroads that produced Baron Davis, Austin Crozier, um, Isaiah Fox went to Arizona, then later on, uh, Sharif O'Neal, uh, Bronny was there for a little bit, but Crossroads. So I ended up going there, not even for basketball, just for academics. And ironically, it's an arts and sciences school. So they really are heavily uh, leaning towards giving you a well-rounded education, but also you get the influence of the arts. And bro, like if you would have told me decades ago when I was in middle school, high school, that I would end up being in the field of art, which is what photography is, I would have looked at you like you out your damn mind. <laughs> but all, it all ended up kind of coming full circle. Um, mm -hmm. But anyway, so yeah, bro, around like my seventh, eighth grade year, or not even that, I'd say going into me being a freshman in high school is when I decided like, okay, I really want to do this because like I had potential, showed flashes. I was a skinny, long athletic kid. So coaches are like, yo, you got a shot. And I really just at that point decided to commit myself to the game. And man, it's, it was, it was fun. Like I, I'll never forget the amount of hours put in running like Santa Monica stairs, working out at Memorial Park. Uh, and then bro, I was fortunate enough. My junior year, I was playing on Barron's, Barron's AAU team. Uh, Rising Stars of America, uh, shout out to Baron, shout out to uh, Trayvon Muhammad, Daryl Roper, um, ended up playing with high, high level guys at the time, Chase Stanbeck, uh, Deshaun Harris, Martez Walker, Jay Sean Hampton, uh, Dane Suttle, James Harden at one point was with us. Um, that to me was a wake up call to a certain extent, because like you think you're good. And then you go and see like folks who are high, high major. And it's like, okay, I got to get back to work. So yeah, bro, long story short, fast forward to a uh, senior year, end up uh, signing with Lehigh University, which I had never heard of prior to, to anything. <laughs> um, funny, funny as it may be, but they had uh, come in with heavy, heavy interest after seeing me play at uh, the Bob Gibbons tournament with Barron's team. Um, and man, to this day, bro, I couldn't really tell you what made me decide Lehigh um, because it's so different from Los Angeles, like going right. from L.A. to Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, which is for for those who don't know Bethlehem, PA Central, it's central Pennsylvania. It's different. It's very much removed from the palm trees and the sand and the beaches like it's it's not that it's a completely different grind but as I actually think about it man I really just I had a hell of a visit in the sense of the vibe that I got from the guys there uh, one being a Zaire Carrington who is now like he's big on the three-on-three -three circuit mm. uh, then a uh, Marquise Hall shout out to him uh, Oregon Oregon legend to say the least um <laughs> He's now a, a Nike guy, which is super dope. And then uh, one of my best friends on the planet, his name is Prince of Small, uh, Long Island guy. We were visiting at the same time and we just we just clicked. Like what's, what's wild is like <laughs> niggas were both wearing uh, some Jordan 14 at the time. <laughs> and from there, like, we just started shopping it and we just literally like we've just been locked in ever since. But yeah, bro, the, the Lehigh journey, man, I don't even know where to... To begin with that but long story short was that lehigh uh then going into my junior year this this 511 skinny kid from ken ohio pops up and <laughs> he's on a, a visit and at the time actually he wasn't even 511 at the time on the visit i want to say it was like 5859 five, he was small but that dude could go like he had a handle had a jumper confidence through the roof i'm like yo this this little nigga can play. Like, he's, he's cool. I, I hope he comes. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, I hope he joins us up here. Um, and fast forward, he shows up on campus, bro. It's like 6'2", 6'3". 
I'm like, yeah, I'm talking to Coach. I'm like, yo, who's who's this dude? They're like, yo, that's CJ. I'm like, no, it's not. Right, like, it's the same it <laughs> And I'm like, ooh. And he maintained, obviously maintained all the skill, everything. He was just bigger. And I'm like, yo, after day, I want to say not even day, you just could tell. You could tell that he just he just had it. He was one of those. He had a Randy had a slow start. I want to say he didn't start his first four games. Um, but then I forget who we were playing, but he just broke out and CJ became CJ. But we ended up uh, by junior year, we got to the NCAA tournament, which was a wild run in its own right, because we beat our biggest rival Lafayette championship game. Um, end up facing the we got honestly, we got shitted on from a, a seeding standpoint. They did us wrong. We ended up playing Kansas overall number one seed. Um, and we were a 16 seed, obviously. And at the time, no 16 seed had beat a one seed, but we gave them a solid run for their money. Um, in my in my opinion, we won what we lost because we beat the spread. <laughs> like we were, oh, we were facts. all the way, bro. We were all the way in it until uh I want to say like the second or third media timeout going into the second half. Then we just ran out of gas. Um but getting to that stage, man, and being able to play, like, again, like, being able to play in the, the NCAA tournament is, that was a dream come true. Because, again, as kids, like, you you see March Madness, and you want to be a part of it if you're a basketball player. And to have been able to do that, man, was, was truly fantastic. Um, fast forward senior year, it, in my opinion, we would have won it again, but we got cheated. Uh, ironically at Bucknell uh, CJ had the ball I want to say we were down might have been down one he had the ball was going to the basket Mike Muscala uh, who is now what he was on the Celtics most recently yep if I'm not mistaken he came across the lane fouled the shit out of CJ they didn't <laughs> he was the player of the year that that year in the conference so obviously he's going to get the calls whatever they didn't call it they end up winning. They end up going to the tournament. Um, but that was the end of my collegiate career. And man, at the time, bro, I didn't know what I was going to do because like collegially, I had a good year. It was solid, but it wasn't, I didn't have a CJ year. So CJ year is like, yo, folks was like, yo, you might go to the league now. I'm like, shit. I wouldn't even be mad at him. You know what I'm saying? Like, go, <laughs> go ahead. After what, you know, he dropped 30 on Kansas. Like, Jeez. okay, it wasn't efficient, whatever, but he dropped 30 on Kansas. Like, bro, you that nigga. <laughs> like, you are, you are him. Like, from a, a mid-major school, like, you did that, bro. Like, so much love and respect to you. But that wasn't my reality. And I'd, I had a little bit of interest just from a bunch of agents um, they were trying to tell me, okay, you know, think about the the D League, this, that, and the third, because they saw my defensive potential more than anything else. But I didn't necessarily want to go that route because, like, again, during the summers, I was working, like, Laker camps just to make some money, and I had interacted with a bunch of, like, overseas pros. Mm -hmm. And they had kind of told me about, like, their life, their lifestyle, and I'm like, damn, this seems, like, seems appealing. So... Long story short, like I ended up uh, hiring an agent and I also like fortunate enough to like I have a British passport. And at the time that passport had value. Now it doesn't because of Brexit. Don't even get me started on that. That's political. This is not yeah. about politics. We're talking yeah. hoops. Um, Obviously, I want to get to um, I want to get to your time in Japan for a second. But before we kind of get to Japan, I do want to put a cap on the in the Lehigh experience, uh, what would you say was your favorite moment memory of, of playing with CJ? And this could be on or off the court. Cause I feel like college uh, days, college, college, you know what I'm saying? You in the dorms, you go, you hanging out. I feel like college, man, I feel like some of the best stories of my life have come from my time in college. What would you say is the first, the best memory that, that you got from- uh, of, of college or of CJ specifically in college? Oh, CJ in college, playing CJ in college. Before we before we get back into the the overseas stuff, I want to put a, put put some wraps on the on the college the college days. I don't, bro. What folks don't know, CJ is funny. Like <laughs> he is one of the funniest dudes. Like he 
he's one of the funniest dudes I've been around, man. Like he's, he's a clown in, but in like a respectful way. Like he's not like a clown, like a goofball, yeah. like he's yeah. just funny. Um, that bro, there's just so many moments. Cause like the Lehigh, the mid, I mean, you know, the mid major struggle, bro. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's different. One of the standout, like, I'm not even a standout. Just a memory is just like, cause at the time, bro, dude was skinny. Like they had CJ in like an oversized jersey, oversized shorts, and he's out there just. Have we seen the photos? <laughs> you know just looking, looking wild, because he was wearing three, and at the time, the jersey like for number three, bro, like a big man. Because again, it's mid major, like they're giving us the uniforms from the year before, bro. So like, three was worn by a big, and so this dude was out there in like a two X jersey, two three X, and just frying. Um. There's just set, bro, so many memories, like in just the practice stuff. I, there's a lot of stuff I can't even speak about. Never will it's come to the grave with me. Um, <laughs> just because, like, but no, nah, there's just some, there are a lot of good moments, bro. There are a lot of good moments to say. Oh, or maybe like a, 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 a on the court memory, maybe like a game that you remember where he was like, damn, this dude's the real deal or a practice or something like that. Where you were like, she's like, because I feel like, Everybody has those moments where you kind of see, like, nah, like this dude a little bit. I, I have a teammate, for example, he actually, he actually from LA. I don't know if you know him or not, but his name is Cameron Young. He went to Westchester. He went to Quinnipiac out here um, on the East Coast. But he, he's, um, man, I remember we, 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 we played Sienna my senior year. Mm -hmm. And like, his game went triple overtime. And like, dude had 55. And I'm <laughs> like, bro, I've never <laughs> seen anybody in my life. Drop fifty in a Division One college basketball game, it like, and I, I feel like at that moment I knew he was like, he was different. He he played uh, G League Ignite this last year with Scoot mm -hmm. and a bunch of guys. He played Italy uh, A One his rookie year, came out of college, so he's, he's still trying to figure out what he's going to do next year. But I feel like when I seen that, I was like, yo, this dude is as like, he's he's a little different. Like he's a little different. That was kind of one of the performances that I'll never forget just watching it. And at the time, I'm red certain too. I had a back injury. Oh, so I had a hey. front row seat. I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> it's ridiculous. Hey. Are there any games or moments from that, uh, from the time at Leah that kind of stick out with, with CJ? I'm really trying to think because it, in all honesty, bro, it feels like it was just a blur of scoring. <laughs> 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 like a legit, bro, like a legit blur of just buckets. So um, maybe we can describe it. A blur of score and buckets. Especially like, yeah, bro. His, so his sophomore year, which was my senior year, like we were we were co-captains. And he, I mean, he averaged 22 a game. Like, I mean, he scored a thousand points in two years. Mm. Um, if I'm not mistaken. But I'm trying to think, bro. Cause again, there were so many games where he just fried. <laughs> Like he really, really fried. Um, I feel like there. Okay, so during our winter break, like this is a time when like campus is relatively dead too. If I'm not oh, mistaken, yeah. um, and we we're playing Marist, and I think he had 35, but it was like. It was the lightest, loudest 35 I feel like I've seen in a, in a cool minute. He, but he got he got busy. And then also, oh, just kidding. I got it. I remember now. Um, Kent State. Mm -hmm. uh, we we're playing Kent State. This was over Thanksgiving break. I actually, I had a front row seat for this too, if I'm not mistaken, because I ended up getting food poisoning from- Oh, Lord. Chicken, chicken parm. Destro to this day, I've, I haven't had chicken parm since. The smell of it still <laughs> back to, to this. Long story short, bro, I had food poisoning, but bro dropped 42 and efficient 42 against Kent State. He single-handedly kept us in the game. And again, like, I think that game was personal for him because Kent State's in Ohio, an Ohio mm -hmm. guy. I feel like they didn't offer him or something like that. Yeah. But he... he he let them know that they made a mistake. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Let's put it that way, bro. Like he got busy. He got busy. And it was, that was one of the moments where I just knew I'm like, yo, this, he's got it. 
So you knew he was lead. You, did you did you know he was NBA when you were when he was a sophomore? I feel like he went what after his junior year, right? After the whole Duke. But what did he, or did he do? He, he didn't do four at Lehigh. Nah, no, I want to say he did four. Oh, for real? Yes, he did. He did four. Wow. I want so. to fact check that for sure. I remember that that do I, that. I remember that Duke game. I think I don't know if that was his junior or senior. Year. But I feel like that was my first time really getting introduced to him. So, okay, okay. No, so he did four. He did four because the Duke, I mean, <laughs> the Duke game was the Duke game. <laughs> right. right. I, bruh, I remember I was in England again. Like, I'm up late watching it. I'm, I'm watching him just get busy. I'm screaming at my computer because I'm watching some bootleg stream. <laughs> bro, like, like, for me, I knew he was going to go after after he did Kansas like that. Because just as a freshman to have, to, honestly, to have the balls to to go and to gun and to get yours like that, like he's he's got it, Thanks. he's absolutely he's got it. But yeah, now nah, there, man. He's there's special. So many, he's special. So many, so many memories, man. That's a that's a special a special individual, a really humble and good guy as well. Like he's he's one of the the greatest people, like as a person that I've encountered on this earth. He's a really good guy, really good guy. Long story short, signed uh, my first professional contract to play in the British Basketball League. And I became a pro. And that was wild in its own right because I'm now amongst the smaller percentages of people. Because as I know, you know, bro, like once, shit, once you get to college, bro, from a number standpoint, things just crack down. Like you go from millions and millions of kids who are playing to thousands. And then from the professional, like to the professional ranks, it's another cut. And it's like, damn, like I managed to, to make it to a certain extent. And man, that it was an adjustment to say the least, because obviously going from playing high, playing against college kids to playing against grown men who are pretty much playing to, put food on their plate for themselves and their families. It's a completely different level of (laughs) physicality uh, and everything. So first few, the first few weeks, it was an adjustment, but I managed to survive. And I say survive because like at, at points, my coach wanted to cut me, but he couldn't cut me because I was doing what I needed to do. Like showing up early, leaving late, just consistently managing to get better. And like, I went from being like a a rotational player at the beginning of the year to like, I finished the season starting and just to kind of overcome that and get through that bit of adversity was, it was dope. It was dope because like, I mean, I, I can't even speak to the, the leaps and bounds that I took in my game from shit going from a freshman in college, freshman to my junior year, then my junior to my senior year, (laughs) then my first year as a pro to my second. So uh, to be completely honest, I did not want to go back to England my second year. But again, my numbers weren't where they needed to be. Like I averaged double figures, but it wasn't standout enough for me Mm. to kind of break out. So kind of took the L was like, all right, let's run it back. And I really got in the lab that summer. Like I got in the lab, like I'm like, okay, now I'm a pro. Like I'm eat, sleeping and breathing this. And long story short, like the next year, like I come back and now I have an understanding of the lay of the land, all that. And I was a completely different beast. And I say beast because I ended up, I led the league in scoring. Like the way that, like the leap that I took from, year one to year two folks in that league had they they hadn't seen it before like I literally up my scoring average by 10 points percentages were the percentages were solid like I I literally was doing like I was doing damn near whatever the hell I wanted to do um and it was it was fantastic like at one point I remember I had a a stretch I was averaging so I was averaging 30 plus over like a five or six game stretch. That's um, hectic. Bro, it was, man, I was cooking. Like I was cooking, seriously cooking, dropped a 40 piece. Like it was, it was like, okay, y'all, like I'm, I'm here. Like I'm here. I'm not fucking around. Like this is what I want to do. And man, 
Then I got hurt. <laughs> then I got Ooh, hurt, bro. bro. And the the worst part about it is this was like during that stretch where like I'm averaging something crazy, bro. And going into this this game against Newcastle, and ironically, like actually, I saw the coach who was a player coach. His name is Fab Fab Flurney. I probably pronounced his last name wrong, but super, super great guy. He's now on staff with the Sixers. He was with the Raptors last year, but he's tied in like with Nick Nurse and them. So I saw him at UCLA. And every time I see him, it's love because, again, like coming out of British basketball, getting to the NBA, NBA adjacent in any capacity is a huge, huge deal. Um, But we were playing against them. Bro, I had, I want to say I got to 12, 14 points in the first like five minutes of this game, bro. Like I was getting busy. I get the ball in transition coming up the court. My dumb ass wanted to be cute and fly, whatever. I was playing in some Jordans, some Jordan 11s. To this day, I'll never play in Jordans ever again because they're not made like they used to be. Long story short, bro, I fractured my ankle rolling in transition. Uh... And I mean, I'm not going to throw people under the bus, but they didn't tell me what exactly was wrong with me to the full extent. All right. So next thing you know, like the coach was honestly, the coach was pressuring me to try and get me to finish that game. And I'm like, bro, like I can barely walk up here. You expect me to run up and down the court. Like, well, I'm a liability at this point. Right. (laughs) Anyway, long story short, kind of rehabbed it over there. They rushed me back. And I still managed to be productive. Like I wasn't anywhere near as efficient, but I was still hitting the numbers that I was hitting before. Right. Um, and yeah, going into going into my third year, I was like, yo, I'm not going back to England after the performance that I had. Again, in hindsight, man, I probably should have stayed another year or two, whatever. But um, long story short, ended up going to play in Cyprus. And Cyprus, obviously, small island in the Mediterranean, bro, paradise. <laughs> like, <laughs> literal paradise, bro. It felt like I was honestly hooping on vacation. That's the best mm-hmm. way I can, I can really describe it. Um, yeah, bro, that, that place was it's one of the most beautiful places that I've ever been in my entire life. And it was actually at that point where I was like, man, I really wish I had a camera just so I could kind of take pictures of, you know, <laughs> of this. Cause I don't know yeah. if I'm going to be able to come back. You know what I'm saying? Right. right. And the wild thing about Cyprus, bro, like Cyprus is literally like the wild, wild west of basketball. I'm still owed money. I'm never going to get. That's fine. It is what it is. I'm at peace with it. But for perspective, we had 18 players go in and out on the season. I wow. was one of only two guys to make it the entire year. And I made it the entire year, despite the coach wanting, he was trying to cut me. He wanted to cut me, but he could not cut me because I was producing at a high level. So it's like, you can't, you can't cut me coach. I'm sorry. You just gonna have to learn to love me. And (laughs) that's what it it became. Like he, I mean, I remember at the end of the year, because we ended up winning a, a cup championship. Like we had a really good year and he just, like we had our little exit meeting or whatever. And he was telling me he had so much respect for me because I consistently proved myself day in and day out. And I, I wasn't, I wasn't going to be sent home. <laughs> like that's really kind of what it came down to. It's like, you're not, I'm not giving you the opportunity to send me home. And so fast forward going into year four, again, now, like I've had multiple good years. I'm thinking here we are, the trajectory is about to go up. And I'm having a great summer too, like getting stronger, getting more skilled. Like I remember that I got hurt again, bro. I'm playing in the Drew, ironically too. Um, it was one of those games where it's like, there was no rhythm, no flow to it. We were actually getting cracked too. But for whatever reason, like I crossed somebody up, took two dribbles and went up to try and dunk. And at the time I was wearing these like, excuse me, these like peach colored LeBron, I want to say they were the 12s or the 13s, whatever, but they had a weird insole. Long story short, as I planted, I felt like a pop and I'm thinking I blew my shoe out. I wish it was my shoe. Long story short, I ended up tearing uh, multiple ligaments in my big toe, like an extreme case of turf toe. And bro, just 
bad luck, <laughs> literally just bad luck, bro. And that ended up setting me out for what's that, like five or six months. So oh, wow. yeah, bro. So I was thinking like everything I was thinking about, okay, like where am I going to go next season? This, that, and the third to like, okay, damn, like I'm not, I'm not even able to walk right now. <laughs> damn. So things got a little dark, but I was fortunate at the time to have some really great people in my life who uh, helped me with the surgery process, the rehab, all that. And fast forward, I end up signing in Sweden, which I never thought I'd go to Sweden, bro. Like what? <laughs> like, and again, like I also, I thought I knew cold just going to the East Coast, East Coast winters, but that Nordic, that Nordic winter, <laughs> man, don't even, different. bro, don't even get me started, bro. Between that and... <laughs> God, don't get me started. Uh, but anyway, my first few games back were they were rocky just because, like, I'm coming off an injury. And coming off an injury, the biggest thing is just getting your confidence back. Right. And fortunate for me, like, the team was patient enough with me because they believed in me. Uh, specifically, this assistant coach, his name is Charles Barton. Um, he he was just stressing like yo nah take your time bro like we know like we know what you can do we know what you're coming coming back from like just take your time and my yeah my first three games were shaky but then like my fourth game it just clicked rhythm came back and I'm like all right y'all let's do this ended up finishing that season pretty strong parlayed that into uh man I managed to sign a two year deal with a team in Greece uh, mm -hmm. at the time uh, a Pallone Patras. Uh, so right after Sweden, I come home for a second, if I'm not mistaken, my memory doesn't fail me because I am getting older now, but came back for a second, then shot back over to Greece. Um, and bro, like playing, playing in Greece, Greece, A1, A1, we were uh, in the cup, cup finals playing against Panathinaikos. And again, for all the, the European basketball fans and honestly, at this point, all hoop fans should know Panathinaikos. Like, yeah, yeah, Panathinaikos and Olympiakos. Those are two exactly. Those you are know about. legendary, legendary Greek teams. And here I am. <laughs> and oh, rewind, bro, because like small footnote. So I thought I knew like what intense fans were like just through like college experiences and seeing rivalry games and stuff like that. But when you get to like Cyprus and Greece, <laughs> like there's a different level of passion that fans have, like fan being rooted in the term fanatic, like it is a real thing because there are real life fanatics, bro. So to flashback to, to Cyprus real quick. So I played like games through three riots. Like there were riots in the gym. Yo, yes, <laughs> I wish I was kidding. Like, I feel like I could dig up some of the video footage from one of them. It was actually, bro, it was the first game of the year. And like the coaches have told us like, and this is again, this is in Cyprus. Coaches have told us like, yo, it's a rivalry game. Like usually whoever wins the first game, like between us, it sets the tone for their entire season. They're like, yo, y'all got to go out, play hard, do your thing. And I'm like, all right, rivalry game, whatever. No big deal. Keep in mind too, like the our rival gym, bro. Like these niggas were next door. <laughs> like their gym was literally next door, bro. So like, imagine just for perspective for anyone listening to to show like proximity. So if you're from LA, like you know where Staples Center is, like that's the building. Yep. Like imagine if, for example, like the Celtics, if their building was where the Magic Johnson sign was, or not sign the statue is right at the front steps of states, like. Crypto. Yep. That's yep. how close it was. So, bro, we're going through warm ups and nobody's in the gym. And they're like 30 minutes left before the game. And I'm like, oh, these niggas just talking shit. They gassing it, whatever. It's not going to yeah. be like that. But I hear like a drum beating from a distance. And I'm just like, <laughs> what's going on? Right. And it's progressively getting louder. There's chanting coming with it. And I'm like, all right, y'all, what, what, what we doing? Then with about 15 minutes left on the clock. These niggas kicked the door in, bro. <laughs> Their fans came storming in, bro. Like flares lit. 
screaming, beating on drums, like wilding, wilding out. Like these niggas is pouring water, they're pouring water on the floor, like in the corner. So like we're going through layup lines and as you go through layups, you know, pass the ball out, whatever, like folks is slipping. They're spitting at us the whole nine. We're like, it's another level. Like, so anyway, fast forward. Uh, we end up like we're winning the game. And one of the moments that this is actually like a standout moment in my professional career. because It's one of the craziest things I've ever experienced. Multiple things that were just crazy and out of this world were in Cyprus. But this one, bro, for whatever reason, the referee decided to inbound the ball to start the second half on the fan side of the, the gym. And so like the way the gym was, was structured is like most of their fans were on one side, then like their execs and some of our fans were on the other. Yep. And they put me right in front of their fans and I'm standing there and like, I already knew what was going to happen because they had been spitting and throwing stuff at us during the game. And I'm standing there, bro. And the ref is taking his sweet time to hand me the ball. And as I'm standing there, bro, like I'm feeling folks like spitting oh at me, my God. throwing shit at me, bro. <laughs> like I swear to God, bro, somebody splashed like piss on me, like wild, wild, bro. And like my teammates, my teammates are dying laughing because they're obviously like, they're on the other side of the court. They see me just standing there. I'm just like, like really? And the ref is even laughing. I'm like, nigga, give me the ball. Like, let's right, let me do it. Like, like, why are we wasting time? So anyway, ball gets inbounded, whatever we go about the game. Fast forward, we're winning. And something that they do in Cyprus, and Cyprus, I don't want to say Cyprus alone, but basically if the fans don't like the way that a game is going to end, like if they don't get their desired outcome, they will not let the game end. <laughs> Like, and when I say they won't let the game end, they won't let the game end. So we're up, like we're smacking them at this point. And they're around four or five minutes left in the game. Next thing you know, fans storm the court. And they're chasing the refs. They're chasing some of our players. Like it's a full on, like full on riot, bro. Like it's insane. And me again, I'm thinking, I'm thinking about my health. I'm thinking about my safety. And I'm thinking about my career. Like, do I want to be on the floor, like throwing hands at fans? Absolutely. Is that conducive for a successful, happy, prosperous professional career? Absolutely not. So I take my black ass off that court so fast. It's not even funny. And there's video, bro. Someone's like, has people like they're hitting folks with sticks. Like it's wild, dog. Wild. That's one instance. Fast forward to the second. Cause I, bro, I can ramble about my career, like playing career for forever. But second, we're in the cup finals. And again, like I'm at, I got fouled. I'm at the free throw line where there may be three or four minutes left in the fourth. I'm going through my free throw routine, knock the first one down, ref tosses the ball back to me, going through it again. And as I go to shoot the ball, I see something coming towards me, like out of my right eye. Oh, Lord. And these niggas threw a lit flare at me at the free throw line it didn't it didn't hit me by the grace of god bro like it landed like on maybe like the first or second like hash mark on the floor but that was like the signal the next thing you know niggas is just fighting in the stands like throwing throwing full on throwing hands the whole nine to the point like the police had to tear gas the stadium to get all the fans out so we ended up finishing the game like the last three minutes with no fans Arena smelled like tear gas the whole nine. Like they kind of took away our joy to a certain extent, but Cyprus. So anyway, bro, fast forward to uh, to Greece. Here I am playing against like some EuroLeague like legends, bro. And again, like I wasn't, at the time, bro, I really wasn't even aware of like what I was doing. Like just the magnitude of it when you really kind of look back at it. Like I had no idea, but I ended up finishing out that, that season there. And I'm thinking like, shit, I signed a two-year deal. And for the overseas folks, like, you know, signing a two-year deal is, two-year deals are hard to come by. <laughs> like they're super, super hard to come by. So like I went into that off season with a little bit of like peace. 
Like, I'm like, man, I can now just focus on the work. I don't have to think about anything else. However, <laughs> as things often happen, so again, like, I'm owed money from Cyprus. I'm owed money from Greece. Um, they end up cleaning house, fired the team president, GM, all that. My contract got wiped with it. So I'm like, oh, shit. Back to the drawing board. And at the time, too, like the agent I was with, I'm like, yo, what's going on? Like, I'm basically trying to be proactive about the situation. And he's not responding to me, getting iced out, which, again, speaks to the overseas journey. Sometimes it's just, just ugly. Like, it's just ugly. Um, but long story short, this dude ends up popping up. I'm not even going to name his name because I'm not just going to bash people. That's not worth it. <laughs> but dude pops up. Three months later, dead ass direct quote is like, oh, I bet you thought I forgot about you. I was like, you have a whole lot of nerve, bro. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I swear to God, bro. I'm like, are you for real? And he's like, yeah, like I've now got an opportunity like with a, a team in Italy, Italy A2. Um, are you ready to go? I'm like, yeah, I'm ready to go. And Again, now to speak to more of like my journey with basketball. So one of the homies had actually put me on with uh, just like commercial acting. And I never, bro, like I'm not an acting type dude. Like I'd gone to maybe one or two auditions, whatever. And there, there was a day like I was in the gym with uh, shit. Ashanti Cook went to Georgetown. Uh, Bobby Brown played in the league. Overseas legend. Honestly, LA legend. Uh, Brandon Bowman, Georgetown. Overseas legend. Um, and I want to say Marcus Johnson too was another like overseas legend, or not overseas legend, excuse me, LA legend, went to Westchester, USC. Um, and my guy Ashanti was like, yo, you should come to this audition today for you know, just a commercial. I'm like, I don't do that. He's like, man, just pull up, it's super light, you know, see what happens. I pull up, and again, it's commercial hoops so it's not real hoop <laughs> but yeah, they're yeah. like they just throw me out there i'm masked up against somebody they're like y'all just play and i'm like fuck that like if you want me to play i'm gonna play so like i'm right. into my whatever and my jumper looks really good on camera so next thing you know like the next day i get a call back and they're like yo we want you to just you know we want to put you on standby like you might have the role this that, and the third and again like i don't know what bro i've never done this before so i'm just rolling with it and I tell my guy Ashanti and he's like, he's getting dumb hype. He's like, you're going to get it. You're going to get it. And I'm like, what makes you say that? He's like, this is just how it is. Like, you're going to get it. Long story short, I end up booking this commercial and it's an Apple commercial with Steph Curry. Jeez. And exactly. So I'm coming off now this, this season where like, I didn't get this contract slash cause I got, it got wiped off the books. I'm waiting on my agent. Hadn't heard anything from him, but the Lord is, is here like, yo, I'm providing for you. I'm like, thank you, Jesus. So right. ends up being a national commercial. Um, and this obviously, this was my first time meeting Steph, like in, in real life. And the way that that man can shoot the ball, he's the greatest to ever shoot a ball for a reason. Let's put it that way. Because yep. one of the part, one of the, like the, standout scenes in the commercials like he's supposed to hit a half court shot this nigga hit three straight off rip <laughs> I, I wish i bro, i wish i was kidding i wish like I the was first kidding. he just first three bruh, boom, boom, boom. Bruh. and we were like we were collectively losing it because it's like there's certain i feel like there's certain people that could just can do stuff at a certain level to where it's just like you just can't you can't help but be in awe Regardless of like what you know, what I'm saying what you do, like it was just fantastic. But anyway, so best to get this commercial and why this even matters is, so I end up going over to Italy, and again, this like I'm in Italy, I'm in Sicily at the time too. Like the GMs really believed in me, liked my game, this, that, and the third. And I remember one night because they told us the commercial was just going to come on uh, during Monday Night Football. And I'm like, oh shit, this is this is big time. 
when the commercial first aired, next thing you know, my phone's blowing up. Everyone's like, yo, is this you in this commercial, this, that, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, yeah, man, like happened to do that, whatever. I like, I just wasn't in America to really kind of celebrate that moment because I was out there. But anyway, um, Italy A2, that was interesting, man, because it was a different level, Um, not in a crazy way. But at the time, I wasn't prepared to be 100% like honest with myself. I was not ready. And I went over there and I wasn't in rhythm initially. And I finally started to get into rhythm. And then just by chance and practice, one of my teammates is cutting down the lane. I go to swipe at the ball. I get ball and jersey. And long story short, in catching jersey, I end up tearing the soft tissue Mm. uh, on my shooting hand. And that was one of the most painful injuries I've ever had because I couldn't dribble, I couldn't shoot. And I'm telling them like, yo, I can't go. I don't know what y'all want me to do. Like, it's just, this is my dominant hand. I can't do anything. Right. And like, play, play, play. I'm like, it's not going to be pretty. They're like, play. So I'm out there, literally, I'm not left-handed, bro. So I'm less than a shell of myself. And I've never misrepresented myself on the court in a way like that in my entire life. But I look, bro, I look trash. <laughs> like I look like trash and a half. So next thing you know, I get cut, obviously, because I'm hurt. This was right. my first time getting cut too. And I was honestly happy to get cut because I was injured and I wanted right. to. Um, and fortunately for me, like managed to get like my rehab in, everything was good. And when it was time for me to get back on the court, like I was working out at a place uh, in Brentwood at the time called Velocity, um, Baron happened to pull up. And Baron was at the time trying to make a comeback himself. Like he had had uh, knee injuries. Obviously, like his career was kind of played by knee injuries. If he hadn't have got hurt, who the hell knows what more of a career he could have had because he still yeah. was that guy. Right. Like he was that guy. Um, but I end up in the gym with him, with him, uh, Frank Robinson, another European legend. He played for Partizan. No, no, he didn't play for Partizan. I want to say he played for Red Star. Um, but Euro legend at the time, Darius Morris, Jordan Hamilton, and who else was in there? And I was like, Rico was running the workouts. And again, just by chance, man, like, with Baron having gone to Crossroads, he would throw camps in the summer. I would always go to his camps. Like I've pretty much known Rico since I was in like middle school. Like that's mm-hmm. the, the first time I met Rico, I was in middle school. And now like I'm working out with him. He's leading the workouts. I'm with Baron. I'm with NBA guys. And I remember day one, I walked in there. And again, coming off injury, I was like, I don't know what this is going to be like, whatever. But I had a decent day then just kept building and building and building and building. And next thing you know, like I'm having some great days to the point where like, they're looking at me like, all right, bro. Like (laughs) you got it. Like you got, you got some game. And now for me, bro, above everything else, like getting that type of respect from my peers is to me what truly matters. Because at the end of the day, like, if the people you're working with and against don't respect you, what are you actually doing? Right. And so in my mind, like those are like the small victories that I would take to keep kind of motivating me. Um, So anyway, got to the point, fully, fully recovered, ready to go. My agent gets me a deal with a team in the Czech Republic and the Czech is different. (laughs) The check is very, very different, bro. Because again, like that's borderline Eastern Europe. Like you could really feel like the heavy Russian influence that had been on that like country. And I was in uh, Brno, which is like the, I want to say it's the third biggest city out mm. there. And it was I cool. think my homie played for them this year, I'm pretty sure. Oh, for real? Mm-hmm. Love that. Love that, love that. Had a but I had a Serbian coach. Serbian coaches, man, hard nose, like, but dude fucked with me heavy. Like, this is he's one of my favorite coaches I've ever had because the level of belief that he had in me was the same level of belief 
that I had in me. And I went out there, bro. And again, like I'm now I'm playing in the check and I just been working out with NBA guys. So I'm coming out there like y'all can't fuck with me. Right. <laughs> like, y'all just can't fuck with me. And I'm just cooking. Like I put up really good numbers. Unfortunately, I didn't sign like I didn't have a buyout in my contract. I wish I did because after a game like three or four, like I had some Turkish teams who wanted to literally get me there for three to four times the money, but yeah. I couldn't get out. Yeah. Um, where did I go after the check? Um, I don't even remember where I went after the check, bro. Just crazy. Uh, I want to talk briefly about your time in Japan. Obviously, I'm, I'm over here playing now. I love it out here in Japan, on and off the court. Um, so talk to me just about your experience playing here. Because, I mean, I feel like, especially you, I mean, for, for context, so you played in Europe, obviously, extensively. Europe and Japan is completely different as far as the style of play, oh, the yeah. fans, like oh, how, they, how they approach the game of basketball. I feel like over here it's a lot more entertainment-based as opposed to, like, life and death where people are spitting on you, all that crazy. So just talk about just your experience playing here in Japan. Man, so... To give it some context, so I finished like my last two years were in Japan. Prior to me being in Japan, I ended up getting back to Italy A2. And I personally have to touch on that because I went over there and let them know like that shit was a fluke. That wasn't me the first that time around. Like, that yeah, was not you. me. Yeah. Like y'all needed to do it. Give me a little bit more time. Let me be healthy so y'all could see who I actually am as a player. Second go around Italy A2, I averaged an efficient 20, I want to say 20 or 21. Um, I think I was around 48 from two, over 40 from three. Like I got busy, bro. Like those highlights, like I let niggas know like, hey, he can really play basketball. Did you Let's match up against the team that cut you? Did you get a chance to match no, up with them? Or? No, unfortunately uh... not. But the GM, the GM circled back and hit me and was like, yo, I'm so happy for you. I believed in you. I knew that you could play here. I knew that you could play at this level. I'm so happy to see you cook it. Mm. So anyway, um, so Japan, bro, Japan, I ended up signing in Japan in 2020. Um, I got there. <laughs> I got there the weekend that they shut the season down. Jeez. So like I signed, I signed my deal, all that. I got there. Like I didn't, I wasn't gonna play in the first week's game because I just got there. Right. Um, but that next week, COVID hit. So I didn't that year get a remotely good experience as far as Japan because what could you do? You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, fortunately for my team, like ownership decided to keep us there. And continue paying us. So we just essentially just worked out. We worked out oh, for wow. at half the season. It was just in team workouts, this, that, and the third. And it was cool. Cause I, bro, to this day, like I loved, I love some of my Japanese teammates. Cause Thanks. if we're talking about again, just the Japanese culture is so respectful. Yeah. And man, I, I don't even know where to begin, but like there's just, it it's it's wonderful and just the way that we meshed as a team during that time was crazy too because at the end of the day we didn't know what the hell was going to happen in the world you know like this is world stopping type stuff and i mean it was wild to also see bro like i'm again i'm in japan i'm watching bro i'm watching folks lose their mind over toilet paper in america like i'm looking at america just embarrassed because folks were acting crazy bro crazy like crazy over like the the most minute minute of things bro and obviously around that time there was a lot of injustice from a social standpoint as far as Ahmad Arbery um don't even, like I don't even want to run down a list of names and that's not right. out of a lack of respect for them but because that stuff it's it's frustrating bro yeah. it's frustrating to say the least and then then on my end I was so far removed that I felt like, you know, I, I didn't know what to do. Right. And meanwhile, I'm, again, I'm blessed to be, I'm in Japan, I'm playing basketball, I'm still getting paid while the world has ended, right. you know, which is just, just wild. Granted, like at the time, too, I'm frying my teammates, like in team scrimmages and stuff, bro. Like I'm cooking, 
long story short, I end up getting a, I end up getting a two year deal out of that team because mm. they really liked what I did during that time. And now where the story starts to change and where things get interesting is so a week before I got back, like at this point, I, I have a camera now mm. and it's COVID. And so the last month and a half, they shut everything down. We were doing Zoom workouts. And this like is, in, are you in the States or are you in Japan? In Japan, bro. In Japan, okay. I'm in Japan, locked down, literally doing team Zoom workouts in my room. And I have this camera that's basically sitting there looking at me. Because at the time, bro, like, I hadn't been doing anything with it. Like, it's, but it's looking at me and I'm looking at it. Like, okay, all right, man, I'm going to go use you. So one day, like, I step out and occasionally, bro, like, when I say occasionally, I mean super rarely, I'd go out and take, like, landscape photos just over the course of, like, the random countries I'd be in. Because mm. I got the camera after I was in Cyprus. So I end up taking pictures of just some random Japanese people, like, in the street. And I'm like, damn, like, I kind of fuck with this. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, this is cool. yeah. And fast forward. The week I get back to America, George Floyd is killed in the manner that he's killed and everything changes. And I have a camera and I'm like, man, I'm getting streets. It's time to document. And that one day turned into four and a half months straight of me being in the streets shooting. Mm -hmm. And again, I graduated Lehigh as a journalism communications major with a minor in Africana studies mm. so it's basically okay thank you God it's now time for me to use this degree that basketball paid for yeah um, and that's what made me fall in love with photography just being able to tell an impactful story through photo and to tell a truthful story through photo because as everybody knows like their facts it's called all facts right that's yes, the sir. name of the product, all facts right yes sir Facts, then there are alternate facts and then there's bullshit facts my yeah. thing was to, to give people like the real as to what was actually happening on the street like in LA um and I fell in love with photography bro to the point I almost didn't go back to Japan for my second year wow because I felt like I had found what I wanted to do but obviously I ended up going um but now I'm coming to Japan I'm not just a basketball player I'm now a basketball player and a photographer right and the world is now open opening up to a certain extent because japan did a way better job of handling covid than america did mm. that's its own separate discussion conversation right right <laughs> uh, <laughs> but so so now bro we're going into the season the season starts late and to speak to to what i'm supposed to be talking about the difference in the basketball bro like again like i'm used to having people screaming at you, not wanting you to perform, booing you, this, that, and the third. In Japan, when one team scores, everybody cheers. Everybody cheers. It doesn't matter. <laughs> doesn't matter, bro. Facts. Like, it truly doesn't matter. They just have to see the ball come in the basket. In fact. So from, like, a, a mental standpoint, like, there's almost a shift because it almost feels like every game is an exhibition because there's just that much joy coming from the fans. Yeah. Um. But I was in, yeah, I was in Shizuoka. I was in B3. The only reason I even went to the team in the first place was because uh, one of my mentors got the coaching job. And at mm. the time, like after my great year in Italy, like I ran into some issues with my agent and representation. And there were a lot of Italian teams that were interested in me, but they just didn't want to bite because they didn't like my representation. Sheesh. Which, exactly. Everything happens for a reason. It's fine. But Anyway, so the coach who I had originally signed to play for, he ended up getting a job with the Ignite mm -hmm. for, I mean, he, it was a sizable contract. Let's put it that way. To the point where I wasn't remotely upset that that man dipped out. Right. Um, but anyway, all in all, bro, playing in Japan, especially as a, being a 6'4 a combo in Japan that's athletic Field date. Man, <laughs> man the, bro, the, highlight, the highlights are wild, bro. 
like they're oh God, they're wild. I gotta check them out. No lie. Like they are check they are out. wild. Um, I mean, I ran into some issues with my coach because we didn't see, bro. We didn't see eye to eye at all. Like how how tell all am am I allowed to be right now? Because I'll one hundred percent tell all. Okay, 100%. let's let's bro, let's put it on front street then. So, um. Obviously, at the time, to get into Japan, you have to be quarantined for two weeks before you can be around people. Yeah. And the fact that they even allowed us into the country to begin with was its own separate thing. Like, we basically got special privileges to be allowed into Japan because they shut right. tourists down, right. which is a beautiful thing that you can do if you're an island, especially when there's a, you know, contagious disease going around. You can just be like, hey, none of y'all nasty motherfuckers is coming in here. Right. <laughs> but they did. So long story short, after two weeks, bro, I'm basically floating around at night. I'm kind of breaking the rules. I'm going out. I'm just shooting photos because why right. not? Right. Right. I, need, I need to do something. I need fresh air. So I didn't interact with anybody on a human level for two weeks. My first practice back, boy, I am happy as all hell because I'm around humans. Right. And then on top of that, it's like, these are some of my homies from the year before. Like, it's love. So I'm right. going through practice and again, being like a veteran, a leader, I'm just trying to make sure everybody's moving in the right direction. Everyone's on a good page. Everything is, you know, love to a certain extent. And one of my teammates just made some, this is a stupid ass turnover. But at this point in my life, I'm not screaming on you for making a dumb turnover because if I scream on you for making a dumb turnover, your body language is going to turn down. Next thing you know, you're now not going to be checked into practice. And it's like, you can't always lead with salt. Sometimes you got to hit people with sugar. Everybody responds differently. Right. So with this guy, I'm like, yo, I'm trying to pick him up with a smile on my face. I'm like, yo, let's get it back. Let's keep going. You know what I'm saying? Next play. Coach comes up to me. Keep in mind, too, I'm coming off the most pro-Black summer of my entire life. Oh, you always feel like Malcolm when Martin. I, bro, bro, when I tell you, like, I was in the streets, I was in the streets, bro. Like, front line, like, cops shooting rubber bullets, tear gas, the whole nine. Like, I was in so many situations that you would not expect me as a basketball player to be in. But right. I felt like I was doing stuff for more than myself. Right. Because, you know what I'm saying? That's, again, that's a separate convo. But anyway, coach runs up on me. He starts cussing. He's like, the fuck are you doing? The fuck are you smiling for? Like, are you some type of fucking joker? This, that, blah, blah, blah. And this is like a white Argentinian man. Oh, Lord. <laughs> and I'm like, hey, bro. <laughs> I don't know who you're talking to like that, respectfully. Like, just like you're a man, I'm a man. All right. The coworker is here. Like, I need you to respect me. Like, I respect you. Like, don't come at me with that bullshit. That set the tone for our relationship for the entire year on top of the fact that I was the only player on the team that he had no input in selecting because mm. management messed with me. They liked me and basically everybody liked me, but him. Right. So that truly set the tone for our relationship on the year. And man, it was, it was Rocky, bro. It was Rocky at points. Like, I really felt like I lost my love for the game because I was restricted and capped in a lot of instances to around 21 to 22 and a half minutes a game, no matter what I did. Yeah. And in that 22 minutes on the season, bro, I averaged, I want to say 15, four and three. It can be fact checked, but a uh, shot. I want to say a shot 48 to 50 from two, 40 from three, 85 from the free throw line in 22 minutes like the efficiency was off the charts right and he just wouldn't give me more and at points he was trying to turn me again turn me and my teammates against each other uh, a dude named novar gadson uh who ironically i played against in college went to writer a uh, big lefty would handle mm. solid great human being and again we knew what the deal was and we're like yo we're not letting you turn us against each other because that's not what this is about we're trying to win um but long story short man we ended up underachieving on the year and like management and ownership they were trying to tell me like yo we know you're upset but you know stay with us for the team like we really like you here we're gonna do right by you this that blah 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 i'm like all right bet man cool like i'm locked in it's not about me it's about the team i want us to win i want us to succeed that's what kept me on board man 
And long story short, we underachieve on the season. I get pulled into this exit meeting and they tell me that they're rocking with the coach and not me. Mm. And they're not going to pull me back. And I'm like, all right, y'all, whatever. Then on top of that, uh, they ultimately end up like bad mouthing me to other teams as well, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so going into what would have been what my 11th year as a pro here I am now offerless because again, as you, as you highlighted Europe, Japan, huge gap between the two Yeah. for whatever reason, a lot of instances, Japan doesn't respect Europe and Europe for damn sure doesn't respect Japan as far as style of play. So here I am now stuck in a, stuck between a rock and a hard place and around October uh like my agent hit me saying like there was a team that wanted me to come in they were B2 but they wanted me to try out and I'm like dog it's this year what and y'all talking about tryout like what what are we talking about like y'all also saw the tape of what I did to to people in your country <laughs> right right last year you know what I'm saying and long story short, it came out that it wasn't a, a tryout for my ability. It was a tryout for my character. And oh, wow. exactly. No, that's what we're not doing. Right. Like, I'm not going to prove my character to anyone like that. Because right. over my 10 years as a pro, my resume, as far as professionalism, like, yes, I might have had some injuries, things like that, whatever. But as far as my professionalism and the way that I interacted and handled things with people and the front office and management impe- and fans, impeccable. Like literally impeccable. So at that point, I was like, you know what, man? It might be time for me to do something else. And mm-hmm. obviously, like I built up a lot of momentum with photography to where like when I came back that summer too, I kind of just hopped right back into things. But there was obviously a, a lot less going on. Um, but yeah, bro, I just said, man, it might be time for me to do something else. And I remember like, I've been working out with, uh, my guy, Roger, Roger is a uh, Luke Richard Bamute's little brother. He plays in France right now. He's super, super talented. Um, but I remember we were working out as soon as he signed and dipped out. Cause I wasn't going to bounce on him <laughs> as soon right. as he out, I'm like, all right, man, it's time for me to figure something else out. And that's where things got really, really interesting, bro. Um, to end the, sure. the, the photography journey really begins because, again, like I got into the mix of stuff with photojournalism and activism and all that. And long story short, one of my friends, I was also a journalist, she was going to uh, Mexico because at the time there was a huge... Well, I mean, there's always a, an immigration slash migrant problem to a certain extent. I say problem because I feel like societally, we don't humanize everybody, which is its own. Again, that's a separate conversation, right. but was deemed the Haitian migrant crisis because there was a huge earthquake in Haiti and thousands upon thousands of Haitians were trekking their way up to the United States through South America. And they ended up getting hung up um, at the southern border in texas so at one point there were thousands of haitians under a bridge in del rio texas and the homegirl was like yo i'm going out here to document this like you're trying to pull up and i'm like i ain't got shit to do why not like let's do it let's do it so end up flying to flying to del rio texas which is a place i truly never thought i'd be in my life bro let me tell you (laughs) and I could do a full on, I could do literally, I could do a full pod on this alone, but I'll shorten it because we got to get to the actual hoop photography stuff. Yeah, yeah. Long story short, bro, <laughs> I was the only black photojournalist, last journalist that was in this migrant camp in Acuna, Mexico. I was the only one. The Haitians were looking at me so crazy because, again, like I'm still fit like a hooper, bro, but I just now have a camera. And they're looking at me like, First off, someone thought I was Haitian. Second, they didn't know why the hell I was there. And the second, like, we talk and engage, they'd just be like, damn, like, thank you for being here. Thank you for, like, for documenting. Like, it was to the point, bro, like, 
again, I nigga, I ended up in the fucking <laughs> Rio Grande River with a camera. Like I'm Jeez. in the river, bro. Like, and there's a point in the <clears> river where you can physically cross it. There's there's no barrier, or there wasn't at the time. Now, now the state of Texas is installing all types of killing devices in the rivers to stop people from getting across. But again, different conversation. But I'm in here shooting people trying to survive. And my main motivation for even being there, bro, is like, these folks look like me. Like, they look like us, bro. And being right. a first generation American, like, my parents are both Nigerian. Like, they came to America and searched for a better life. Like, I saw something that <laughs> I'm like, this could, this literally was my parents. Like, I'm the product of, like, to a certain extent, the success of this dream. Right. Like, there was a, a real place of point of significance in that for me. But long story short, did a bunch of like photojournalism stuff like that. And I mean, another moment, bro, a train derailed in front of me, downtown LA. That's a whole nother story. Like, bro, I just did some wild situations. But to get to hoop, so uh, the young homies, uh, my guy Leland King, who uh, went to UCSB, uh, also was at Brown in Nevada. Um, he started an adult league for a bunch of the younger homies who had just pretty much retired from playing high level collegiate basketball. Um, so it's a bunch of high level D one guys who are just hooping for fun called the, uh, the elite washed. And I wasn't playing basketball at all. I bro, I dropped basketball, cold Turkey. I'm like, I put so much of my life into this game. Let me just see what something else is like, but bro hit me up like, yo, do you want to like shoot us? Is that possible? Like we need a photographer. And I'm like, man, I don't know if I want to do this, whatever. And I'm just like, fuck it. And I pulled up and I started shooting hoop, bro. And I'm like, damn, this is it. <laughs> mm. Like, just like that, bro. Fell in love with it. Straight up fell in love with it. And to a certain extent, bro, the rest is, the rest is history. And Again, where it really gets crazy is that was, because we're now in 2023. That was like February of 2022. Damn, that's crazy. Wait, so, so then how did you, yeah, I was going to say, so then from going from just shooting like a elite washed league, right? First of all, how do you go from there to being able to shoot NBA games? Because you can't just pull up to an NBA gym and get credentialed like that. So how does that whole process work? going from just shooting kind of, you know, lifestyle and photography like that to going to shooting NBA games. How did that transition work? To be, to be completely blunt and honest with you, bro, God. God. Hey. God. <laughs> God. Like, literally, God, bro. Because obviously I was doing that. I fell in love with it. And I, I didn't even really know what I wanted to do with it and where I wanted to take it. But again circling back to the value of existing relationships in life. Like when one of your friends happens to be the head of the NBA players association and a max deal player in the NBA, and you never necessarily ask for anything, you just show love and support. I think genuinely when you just real with people and like just, just show love, people want to do the same in return. Um, and I'm like, bro, I'm very, very big on just showing love because I, I do things with zero expectation of getting anything in return. I do like I just try to be a good person for the sake of being a good person. Right. And in some instances, it's it's played out in, in my favor. So like I ended up I hit I hit CJ. I'm like, yo, bro, like I know y'all coming into town. Like, is there any way I could get a media pass? Because I would love to shoot one of your games. Like I just pulled up, just took a shot having no idea about the process or anything like that. Cause at this point too, I didn't know any photographers that I could just hit up and ask, like, how do you do this? Like right. I was in the photojournalist space chilling and C started laughing. Cause he's like, nobody's ever asked me for that. Like everyone just asked for tickets. You know what I'm saying? And here I am right. asking a credential and I got credentialed and the first professional game I'm shooting is a Laker game. Like the Pelicans are playing the Lakers. And again, bro, like I'm just, I'm literally <laughs> drunk off 
optimism, just rolling into, into crypto. Like I know what I'm doing, knowing I have no idea what the hell I'm doing. Like I'm literally learning on the fly, like pregame routines going up. I'm just in my own world. Like, yo, this is a dope angle. Click, click. You know what I'm saying? Like just doing my thing. And again, I didn't understand the magnitude of it until like until a year later, but I managed to get in the door and I got some, I got some solid flicks. Um, and they didn't necessarily look like things that other people were doing, which is also what kind of benefits me. Cause I feel like my eye is a combination of things that I learned just through street photography mm. then photojournalism. Like it's just a combination of all those things. And so I see and capture basketball in a different, in a different way. Mm. Um, but yeah, bro, shot that first game, posted those picks and was like, yo, this is solid. I kind of want to do more of this. And after I posted those picks, like people saw them and were excited. And then some people just started reaching out and opportunity just started kind of building on top of itself. Um, so one of my other teammates then reached out, uh, Zaire, who's big on the three on three circuit. He's like, yo, we're doing a a training camp out in Chicago. We'd love if you could come like shoot it. Love your work. This and the third. I'm like, say less. Did that. Then um, folks with uh, the hoop bus, which uh, is tied in with like the Venice Basketball League. They happen to be doing uh, some activations and stuff with the WNBA draft in New York. And they asked me if I wanted to kind of jump on and shoot for them. Shot for them. Those photos kind of went crazy. Um. Then in addition to that, started shooting the Drew. Um, then I got connected with a, a creative company. So I started doing some stuff for New Balance. And at this point, bro, the ball is just like, it's Rude. rolling. Then um, the Pelicans got into the play-in. And again, at this point, like I'm tapped in with the media folks, with the Pelicans. And got credentials for one of those games. And I'm just getting nothing but positive kind of feedback and returns from what I'm doing. And then again, with the New Balance stuff, they really like my work. So next thing you know, all their basketball guys get together in Vegas in the summer. That's where they shoot their content. I get pulled on set to do some shooting. Um, got some crazy photos up there, blew some, like blew some people's minds with some stuff that that I captured, like I taught myself some stuff on the fly too. Mm. And it's one thing just kept leading to another. And again, I'm shooting the Drew League as well. Like I'm now not playing the Drew, I'm shooting the Drew. And again, it's like me just seeing familiar faces, except now I don't have shoes. I just have a camera. Yep. So I'm, again, existing relationships have definitely helped me advance uh, from Man. an access standpoint. Obviously, like, I'm putting in the work for sure. Like I'm definitely busting my ass, but the existing relationships I have have definitely played a huge factor in kind of helping me get opportunities and get into, into some doors and some for spots sure. that I wouldn't necessarily be able to. And That's where true. things really, really got crazy is uh, with Rico's runs last year. So honestly, yeah, a year ago, <laughs> year ago, just shooting the runs, and again, like I'm continuing to get better and better at the craft. And I mean, I still feel like I have so much to learn, but I'm capturing things again in a different way than a lot of other people are. And I remember I caught one of, shoot, two or three of like my favorite images, just a crazy one of Paul George. She's being guarded by Pascal Siakam. And I'm like standing on the sideline because UCLA, it obviously has three courts. and it, there, there's a super select group of photographers who are allowed the privilege of being in there. And I say privilege because it is 1 million percent of privilege. And with privilege comes responsibility. And you can't be in there to bullshit, for lack of better right. words. Like you have to know that at the end of the day, like in some instances, in just any pickup run anywhere, there's stuff that's going to happen that yeah, could you could you film this? Could it go viral? Sure, but is that worth it? No. Are you trying to make people look bad? Fuck no. Because yeah. in my mind, too, like, bro, granted I'm retired, but these are still like 
we hoopers. It's like peers. Right. right, you know what I'm, right. I'm not gonna make I'm not gonna make the homies look bad. Like right. that's why now, bro, like there'll be certain clips and stuff that leak. And I'm just like, what is wrong with some people for leaking this stuff? Like, there's no need for this to be out at all. Right. Um, but anyway, bro, like got some photos from in there and things just started booming because now like I'm obviously getting better and better at my craft. But in addition to that, I'm blessed with the opportunity to shoot some of the best basketball players on the earth. Like, Thanks. bro, I remember when, when Steph strolled in, bro, I'm like, oh, this is going to be a day. This is going to be a good day. And I told myself, like, you are about to have a legendary day. And by the grace of God, bro, it happened. <laughs> like, it definitely happened. I got some, I got some wild Steph photos. Um, and once Rico's run ended, like his, the, once the month ended pretty much, I was just sitting there like now knowing like, okay, I belong in this space from a creative standpoint. Um, obviously like I've been in this space to a certain extent as a basketball player, but now like, I want to see what more I can do. 100%. 100%. And I just, I, I was kind of hell bent on finding my way to open doors to to shoot more basketball content, more basketball games. Um, I remember the start of the year, uh, start of the NBA season, excuse me. Uh, the Clippers had a preseason game in Seattle. They're playing Portland. And I had a way to get credentialed. So I'm like, okay, you know what? I'm a gamble and bet on myself. And we're going to Washington. We're going to Seattle. <laughs> we're going to have some fun. Shot the game, met some dope other photographers up there. It was good vibes that I knew uh, the season was starting uh, again. Like I knew I could get the important thing, which is access through like the Pels. So like I hit CJ, I'm like, yo, home opener, Brooklyn. Like, I'd love if I could shoot, you know what I'm saying? Like what's up for lack of better words, connect me with their media guys and was blessed again with the access and with it being in Brooklyn, it was honestly like a low key Lehigh reunion. Because a lot of like our former teammates, shit, our coach was there with his kids. Like it was just, it was, it was dope. And again, at that moment, I caught some, caught some dope pics of him. Some of uh, Jose Alvarado. Uh, these are just the ones that really stand out. Some crazy ones of Kyrie that went viral, um, which is funny to say because fast forward to this summer, like Kyrie plays in the Drew. And I'm yep. one of photographers that's allowed to have the access to really like be in there, like that real level of that level of access, like locker room access. Right. And again, with great access to me comes great responsibility. And obviously the responsibility end of things is that's light. It's like, I'm, I'm here to make people look as good as possible. Like that's my job is to, is to shine the best light on whoever my subject is. Mm -hmm. That's in front of my lens. Because what I found out through photojournalism, bro, is like that camera's a weapon, bro. <laughs> like sure. it is a serious, serious weapon. And it all depends on how you use it. And from an activism standpoint, bruh, I'm shining light on everything I can. If somebody's wilding, especially in a way that's disrespectful to me or my people, I'm capturing it. Yeah. <laughs> and with hoop, it's a completely different vibe where it's like if somebody's doing something that's that's beautiful, bruh, <laughs> again, I'm capturing, I'm trying to magnify it and amplify it in whatever way possible. So yeah, um, yeah got tapped in, started off with Brooklyn, then one of my homegirls who works for uh, Aqua Caliente, like the Clippers uh, G League team, mm -hmm. she looked out and connected me with some of like the Clipper folk. And the rest is is history. Like I got locked in with, uh, with the Clippers and kind of started running from there. There's a lot of other stuff uh, from a business standpoint that I'm not necessarily too privy to talk about at yep, the yep, moment. Yep, yep. <laughs> Um, but a lot of opportunity kind of just started falling my way because I bet on myself and I was willing to a believe in my ability and then b believe in the fact that I could succeed in the space. 
And 100%. what's funny about it too, is again, like being a former player, like most people would think that that is what I would lead with, but bro, like former does not mean current. So why am I, don't nobody care. <laughs> like mm-hmm. as soon as you retire, bro, it's, it's a wrap. People don't care like that anymore. So in yeah. my mind, it's like, I'm not, I'm a photographer. Like right. for the longest, bro, like I was honestly on the fence and even really announcing the fact that like, I really used to hoop, like for real, mm-hmm. for real. Cause right. again, it just doesn't matter. Right. And to me, if you're behind the lens, your job is to document and amplify what's in front of it and not yourself. Right. Like I kind of come at it with a selfless approach. Right. you got um, to though. You got exactly. to. Exactly. Which isn't, and that's not, yeah. that's not knocking anybody who happens to promote themselves or whatnot, like yeah. go ahead. But my personal choice is to be more low key about my own personal experiences with basketball, because to me, they're not necessarily that they're important to me, but they're not important to everybody else, at least right. to project it. Like if you want to sit down and talk about it, hell yeah, we could chop it. Shit. We're doing it now. Right. <laughs> Thanks. I'm I want to, bro- um, no, 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 hundred percent. I feel like yeah. I feel like it's 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 definitely one of the things to where it's like if you know, you know, though. Kind of like you said, it's exactly. one of those things. Like if you know, you know, and as long as you have to respect your peers and the real ones can go, they go, oh, we go check that tape. You know what I'm saying? Exactly, exactly. Um, I want to ask you though, man, because I feel like you kind of walked us through the whole basketball journey, street photography, getting into the NBA photography now, yeah. right? And over the last year. Just like I said, I, I was able to meet you during this last year, you know, in this kind of rookie rookie run that you had and stuff. And you you captioned your, your photo on IG, kind of recapping the year, hashtag rookie of the year. And I just want to give you an opportunity to reflect on, like, now that the season's over, right? And you have some time to really think back on, like, damn, bro, like, look at how far I've came. Right? You had an opportunity to shoot the NBA Finals this past year. And, you know, you shot all these, you know, legendary players. How do you reflect back on where you've been able to take photography, the moments you've been able to have in this NBA space, and just how much it means to be able to be in this space now as a second career? Because that's not something that's easy to do, man, after coming from basketball, being able to transition into something else that quickly and reach this level of success. So to be able to be where you are now, how do you reflect back on just the last year or two being able to you know, accomplish what you have, man. Again, bro. Like God, dog. <laughs> like <laughs> literally, God, bro. I feel like I'm I'm extremely blessed to have been given some of the opportunities to attempt to display the gift that I feel like I have as being able to kind of capture imagery. And it's it's honestly it's it's unreal, bro. To to go from because what was it? It was maybe three or four days ago, like the Hawks shared one of my uh, pictures of uh, Anyeke Okongwu. Like I managed to capture him. Uh, he caught a dunk in the Drew and bro literally pointed at my lens as I'm shooting. So like there's a picture of him hanging on the rim, making direct eye contact with my camera and pointing at it. Like, so the Hawks, bro, the Hawks, their account shared that image. And a year ago, bro, no one had any idea who the hell I was taking pictures. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I was truly just doing it out of love. Not that I'm not now, because I still am. Like, I, I'm grateful for all that has come as a result of it. But at the end of the day, like, I do this because I love it. And it's my way of still staying close to one of the things that I love the most on this earth, which is basketball. But to be able to kind of progress in the space again bro like i i I credit it to to god and being blessed with the ability to kind of capture things and capture moments in in a unique way because again man like and i said rookie of the year because bro like if you would have told me in august of last year that i would go from capturing a bunch of like viral images of dudes in the summer to some viral ones during the season to get into the top of the mountain, bro. Like, if I'm not mistaken, I was one of maybe three quote unquote freelance photographers who were credentialed to shoot the finals, bro. Like, come on, man. (laughs) Like, like, come on, bro. 
Like it's it's un it's unreal. And um, I mean, there's that's why there's not a there's not an arrogant bone in my body, bro, because I just know that I'm seriously, I'm I'm so blessed. I'm just so grateful to have the the chance. And I mean, you had a you actually had one of the homies on uh a few a week ago, maybe a uh, Trey. Yes, sir. And obviously he was in he was in Denver shooting the finals also. Yep. So like just to just to to get to the top of the mountain to a certain extent, bro, in a very quick way, it's again, it just it doesn't feel real. But I just know that I'm so grateful to have had the opportunity. And I just hope I could continue to capture kind of compelling images through sports that would make people want to put me in the position to kind of capture history to a certain extent. 100%. That's really, that's really kind of what it comes down to. Like it's, it's history. And to 100%. be able to capture some of the, the greatest people on this planet doing, <laughs> doing what they love and doing it at a high level, man, it's, it's wild. Like obviously did the finals, but to see Steph go crazy in that game seven in Sacramento, like I got to shoot that bro. Legendary. Like I, Dog, I got to shoot Russ going ham like in Phoenix and reinventing himself to a certain extent because there are people who wrote him off. Him being an LA guy, I'm never going to write. I'm never writing off an LA Hooper, period, because that's just what it is. But just being able to capture that, man, and like then being able to shoot for slam, like, bro, like, and where also where it really comes full circle, man, it's like as a kid, in middle school, bro, like I'd go through slam like religiously. And I'm out here, I'm cutting out the photos, I'm cutting out the posters, like they're decorating like my walls, bro. I had a whole slam wall in my room. The covers, you know I used to take the covers and the posters and, and put them yeah. in my room, my whole wall. <laughs> and and bro, so to to go from doing that to now shooting for that outlet is is crazy than to having the opportunity to meet some of the folks who shot some of those photos. Like again, in, in middle school, dog, I never thought I'd meet these people. I never thought, you know, and no disrespect to them, I never thought I would care enough to know who these people are. But now being in the space and knowing some of the legendary stuff that these folks have captured, it's like, yo, y'all, y'all are it. <laughs> like y'all are really it. So. Nice. It's bro, it's just been, man, it's been such a blessing to say, to say the least. And I'm so, so grateful to have had the opportunity, especially in my first year to kind of cover so much ground and do so much and yeah. uh, just praying like, and God willing, like I'll have similar, if not more opportunity going into, uh, into this second year. Amen. Amen. That's it. I want to ask you like, what, I got, two, I, got, I got two questions for you, and then we're going to get into some quick hitters and get you, get you all out of the door, man. Um, but I want to ask you two, two, two questions, and one of them is, what advice would you give to Hoopers that are trying to transition out of the game or trying to find that next thing, right? Because as a Hooper, you played for 10 years overseas, right? You didn't have a cup of coffee. Like you had a long career. Yeah. Basketball is your life, right, for so long. And then when you're all of a sudden not a player anymore, a lot of people struggle with trying to find that next passion, that next thing, right? And you mentioned how, like, you were kind of in that period in Japan where you were like, hold on, like, I might not even go back to Japan because I, I might have found love for photography, right? And now going from that to now where this is your full-time career and you're, you know, capturing these amazing moments, what advice would you give to a hooper that's trying to figure out how to transition after the game after retirement um man yeah that's a real question first off um first and foremost don't be afraid to fail like you can't be afraid to fail because i feel like during the tra during transitional phases what we tend to forget myself included because bro i'm not above any of this like even with hoop it took so long and so much work to get to a point where you could call yourself a professional, to where you could call yourself a division one athlete, to where you can call yourself a high school player. But because of age, I feel like we're more willing to accept certain failures and certain shortcomings because we think that we have time. As adults, as retired, as retired athletes, man, like bro, 
I'm, I'm in my thirties, dog. I have so much life left. <laughs> like there are folks that retire in their mid twenties. You know what I'm saying? Like there's so much time to discover other passions and other loves. And you just can't be afraid to kind of fail in that route to, to finding it because like, again, it, photography is my main thing that I'm doing right now, but it's not the only thing that I kind of stumbled upon. Like mm. I also, I write scripts and screenplays and I'm a better writer than I am a photographer. And oh, wow. now people know that now people know that, but it's been low key. Like that I think will be the ultimate progression because you could write when you like 70, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm not going to wait now respectfully shout out to the writers by the way who are striking because pay them motherfuckers right now right <laughs> but there are so many other things that you can do you just can't be afraid to fail because at the end of the day too bro with basketball specifically basketball players are creative geniuses people don't understand that because basketball, for all intents and purposes, is a game that is 1,000% improv. Mm -hmm. You'll get a set, and you'll have a play. And yeah, you can run the play. But after that, you got to cognitively think, like, I need to make a move to get this guy. I need to make my body do this to make him go this way and to get the defense to go that way. And your mind is calculating all of this at the same time. Like, so for when people try to say athletes are stupid, especially like hoopers are stupid, like, nah, right. it takes the, the, the mental capacity that we actually have to manipulate a game and the flow of a game and the course of a game. Like there's, there's so much. So again, I would say, just don't be afraid to fail. Don't shortchange yourself and just, just boldly be out there doing, doing things that make you happy. And I mean, it's going to get dark. Like it definitely got dark for me, bro, but just know that there is a light at the end of the tunnel, like to say the least. You 100%. just gotta, gotta persevere. And I mean, shit, I posted something yesterday. Like the last slide was just don't fucking quit. Like that's really it. Yeah. Just, just keep grinding and you will find that, that passion and that purpose. 100%. I love that. I love that. Um, last question to ask before we kind of get into some quick hitters, man. Right. You mentioned the photography journey, right. But you mentioned you, also, you, you call yourself a creative, you know what I'm saying? You don't just take pictures, you do a bunch of different things. You mentioned just now, you know, writing, right? And my question for you is what, I feel like as a player, right? You know, as a basketball player, when you're a kid, right? When you say, Dad, what do you want to do? I, I want to make it to the league. You know what I'm saying? That's like everybody's dream. Where do you want this next phase of your life to go, right? What is that? What is that like, damn, man, this is what, this is, if I could do this in this creative space, in this, photography space in this you know writing directing space like what would you what's next for for be like man. mike man first off bro it's crazy you ask this because word, words have power first and foremost like words have power so now i'm gonna have to say something that i'm gonna have to speak into existence <laughs> which so 100%. thank you for putting me on the spot in this moment no doubt. But i truly feel as if I, again, I'm uniquely positioned to where I have a great eye photographically. And I say that humbly. Um, and I still have all the knowledge and insight of a player. Um, and I'm also able to articulate that and put it on paper. Um, so with that, I mean, my mind instantly goes towards like marketing, branding stuff with various companies, be it an Adidas, be it a Nike, be it a New Balance. Um, there's a lot of value there from a creative standpoint, especially tied into the basketball side of things, because there's a level of who culture that I'm a part of that execs could never get to, regardless of how much studying, what type of friendships they had, like, they just can't do it because I did it. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Right. So right. There's a lot of value in that, if you can see it. Um, then also in just my ability to relate to players, because again, I, bro, I, I'm retired, but I still see myself as a Hooper with a camera. Like mm. I'll be on the court, bro. Somebody will hit somebody with some shit and I'll be like, damn, you know, like it, it's, it's just, there's a different level of appreciation for it because like, when you know the amount of hours it takes to, to really perfect some shit like that, it's just, it's just different. But again, big picture, bro. I'd love to be 
like the basketball version of a Gordon Parks or an Atiba Jefferson. And Atiba is legendary photographer, just like Gordon Parks. I mean, Gordon Parks turned photography into directing, producing, writing, all the above. Um, Atiba started shooting skating, but he managed to cross over to hoop. And a lot of the mm. slam covers that you loved growing up, and even the slam covers to this day, Atiba is shooting those. Jeez. So I'd love to do to do stuff like that and to to honestly to capture impactful moments. I'd love to work with with players, um, kind of help them shape their brand and just capture themselves in a good light. Um I mean, the potential is endless, bro. Like I, I don't want to say that there's one thing I want to do specifically, but there, there's so much that I feel like can be done. And I feel like I'm blessed in the sense that I'm a mixture of so many different things. And I think, yeah, I, again, I humbly just feel like there's only one me and I mean, there's honestly, there's only one of everybody and everyone has a, spe a special kind of mixture of things within themselves that separates them from other people. And I just hope I can use the, the mixture of things that I've been blessed with to, to make some impactful art, man. And that's really kind of what it comes down to. Like, 100%. so yeah, the way I view it, bro, like I'm not just taking photos. Like I'm trying to capture the artistic side of things more than anything else. That's love, man. I thought y'all was beautifully put. And I love how you said that there's power in, in, in speaking things, in speaking life and things. So, you know, we're going to have to circle back on this a few years back, man. Run this oh, hell yeah. part no, two back in the pod. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and we're going to be able to refer to this moment. Like, you know, we, we claimed it in advance. We claimed it in advance. But um, we'll get you some, some, some quick hitters, man. Let me go and wrap it up, man. So these next questions, I want you to just say the first thing that comes to your mind, right? So... The first one is going to be, give me your top three favorite photos you've ever taken. Or you can give us five if you want. Top three or top five? Uh, you know what I'm saying? Okay. If, if top okay. three is too difficult. Um, top three would be really hard, but in no particular order. Um, I know these two are actually pinned to my page right now. There's one of LeBron. I managed to catch LeBron seemingly looking right at my camera during a pregame at a Laker game. Um, the way the light was set in the in crypto too was crazy. Like just got that perfect kind of eye contact. Love that one. I got another of Russ in Phoenix uh, during the playoffs. Like there was a spotlight that was hitting him during the timeout. And so it's a very moody picture where he's pretty much the focus of it. He's like really well lit. Um, another is... Uh, a portrait of Steph Curry sitting down at uh, UCLA men's gym. Um, another is, I caught Kawhi catching a crazy, a crazy body on somebody. I forget who it was. Um, I think it was against either the Knicks or the Raptors. Um, then, man, there's so many, bro. There's another, uh, caught Victor Wambayana. Uh, this is his first go around in the States where they played the Ignite last year. Mm -hmm. um, I completely forgot to mention how that story even came about, but that was a wild situation too. Um, but it's him signing an autograph. There's a kid like pointing seemingly at the camera as he's signing. It's just wild. Um, what else, bro? There's so many. Then I love like the, the logo shots. Because mm -hmm. like, Again, trying to just be, think outside of the box. Like, I'll go up to like the 300 section, and up there you can really kind of, at least in my mind, you can play with like the spacing on the floor, and you can right. individuals in certain positions. Right. Just love doing that. I had a there's a crazy one of, I want to say of Russ, then another wild one of uh, AD catching a lob. Um, bro, there's there's so many, man. I don't even know where love to it. get. Love it. To love it. Love it. Love it. All right. Um, top three loudest arenas you've been in in the NBA? Sacramento. Sacramento. <laughs> <laughs> no, I say uh, Sacramento, bro. Sacramento is wild. They're wild up there. Like, yeah. they are wild up there, bro. 
uh, this is, is no particular order. Sacramento, Denver. Denver gets pretty crazy. And hmm, I'd say Chase Center. Mm, okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I know it got really loud in Oracle, so I'm, I'm surprised to hear Chase Center is rock and roll. But I, I just had a chance to go to the Golden One Center in Sacramento when they played the Warriors, like the end of the regular season before the hey, playoff game. Hey, okay, so okay. I got I got folks out there. It's definitely a great arena, great atmosphere yeah. out there to catch a game. Um, uh, so the last one we're going to do, man, this is going to be a fun segment. This is going to be the first time we're doing this, so I'm, I'm, okay. I'm excited okay. for this segment. We're going to do a draft, right? And I like this. I got this from a uh, podcast, P. You know, see how, how they do these draft segments, right? So we're going to do a draft. We're going to do five picks. We're going to start off with you, and then we're going to alternate back and forth. Okay. We're going to do our top five favorite sports movies ever. Okay, cool. Bet. Bet. So start we'll, let you, yeah, we'll let you get the first pick. Uh, he got game. Ooh, okay, okay. <laughs> my, my number one pick is going to be Space Jam. Ah, uh, okay. okay. <laughs> um, I'm gonna say stay hoop genre. Go with uh, uh, blue chips. You know what's crazy? But I've never seen that movie, and what? I, I hate, I hate Bruh. that. For I hate that for me. Bruh, <laughs> that, bro, bro, tonight, bro. If you don't hit the streets of Osaka, bro, watch Blue Chips, man. Like, say watch less. it, bro. It's a, it's an underrated classic. You know what? I'm definitely hitting the streets tonight, but I'm going I'm to watch it tomorrow <laughs> on, my, on my recovery day. On my recovery day, I, I'll tune in to Blue Chips. <laughs> I'm crying. I'm All right, crying. so my number two pick, my number two pick, I'm thinking in the basketball genre as well, but see, I'm a simp. I'm a simp at heart. So my, my number two movie saying, is going to love and basketball, 100%. Okay. For okay. me, Quincy of Monica. Okay. And see, you know, say that's my second pick. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not even going. I'm not going to knock that at all, bro. Um, my third. Oh, oh my God! Uh, Jamie Fox football movie. Um, fuck. Uh, what is that called? Oh my God! Why am I blanking? Hold up, I'm cheating. Uh, <laughs> nah, because it's gonna bother me. Uh, Willie Beeman. Oh my God. Uh, any given Sunday. There we go. Mm, you know what? You get my movie list up because I'm I'm writing these. I've heard of that movie, but I never watched <laughs> that one either. Bro, so. <laughs> some some like real life, like some real life classics, bro. I'm I'm loving this. I'm loving this. I'm loving this. I'm, that's, that's but I, I know about both of those movies. I just have to get them on okay. the list. So that's that's okay. two movies I'm adding to the list, right? Okay. All right. My third pick. I'm going Coach Carter. Coach Carter. I feel like that's an amazing story. You know what I'm saying? I feel like that's a, a super classic. So that's going to be my third pick. I'm going to say... <laughs> uh, I'm going to go with football again and rock with uh, the water boy. Um, the classic, classic, <laughs> classic, classic. Oh, man. Okay. My fourth pick... <sighs> Fourth pick is gonna be above the rim. Damn, I'm out. I forgot about that shit. Yo, <laughs> above the rim is about number Tommy four. Shepard. Yes, sir. Oh, yes, sir. Yeah. yeah, that's a good one, bro. That's a really, really good one. Um, since you took that from me, I'm gonna say. Can I have two? Two my, like my last one be? Can I get two picks? I, I'll give it to you. This, this oh, the first. It's the first. The first cool, guest cool, doing cool, this show, cool. so you get special privileges. They're both uh, Adam Sandler's in both of them. One is a uh, hustle, mm -hmm. and the other is a uh, oh my god, the gambling movie. Kevin Garnett's in it. Fuck. Um, Uncut Gems. There we go. Mm, okay, I've never that's, seen that. That's one. like kind of sports. Okay. Sports okay. But you that's another one, bro. You gotta you gotta check it. You gotta check Say it. Say less. So my last my last sports movie, I'm I I I got four basketball ones, so I gotta go into another genre, you know what I'm saying? And mine's gonna be the sandlot, you know what I'm saying? Classic. Baseball Joe. Classic. 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 That is my five. I like that. I I like your picks though, man. You definitely gave me some classics, you know, since so for the people out there, if any of these movies on this list you haven't you haven't tuned into, man, go go ahead and do that on this. 
on this wonderful week, man. You, 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 you'll thank us later. Um, uh, this has been great, man. The last question we always ask our guests, shout out to all the smoke. Who is one person that we should have on the What's in Your Bag podcast? But whoever you say, you got to get in your point guard bag and give us the assist and, and help us get them on. This could be a hooper. This could be a photographer. It could be somebody in, else in the creative NBA space. We've had a bunch of people ranging on the podcast. We've had photographers, designers, stylists, obviously hoopers. So, um, you know, any, any, any area that you think this person has a dope story that people will benefit from, um, and who would that person be? So there are two people I could say, um, the one that I'll say first is one of my colleagues. Her name is Catherine, Catherine Mm -hmm. Tong. Um, her story is incredible. That's all I'll say. Her story, her story with hoop is incredible. Uh, you actually had one of her friends on the pod too. Ashley, right? Yep. That's so funny because Ashley, that was the person Ashley mentioned as well. Really? I swear. <laughs> <laughs> she mentioned it as well. So you got to give it somebody else too. Because you know what's funny? Okay. That? Yo, she, so I, we, we're literally in the middle of this segment. And she literally, like Ashley says her name. And then she FaceTimes her. Like, and she's like, oh my gosh, she's calling me right now. Like, yo, this yeah, is fake. This yeah, is fake. Yeah, yeah. This is fake. Yeah. She's she's definitely one, and then the second would be. I mean, it would be two because they're a brother and sister duo. But Ashton and uh, Jordan Swiss, Swiss cultures. cultures. Yeah, for sure. You gotta make that happen. Like, like big, big. I mean, big, big. Shout out to Swiss cultures because they really came in and shed a. At least initially, they still do, but they really shed a light on the overseas grind. A hundred percent. And and those who, I mean, and that in some instances, that struggle, like the struggle, the grind, the blessing that is playing basketball overseas, they've really done, I mean, flowers to them to say, to say the absolute least, because they've really done their thing. A hundred percent. See, I, I tried to get Ashley on the podcast while I was in LA. So, you know, so hopefully if, if we get that be like Mike assist, you know what I'm saying? She'll have no <laughs> choice. So no choice but to come on. Her, 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 her or Jordan, her and Jordan, you know what I'm saying? We could do a do episode or something like that. That'd be dope to get both of them on, man. So Ashton, if you listen to this, man, we're coming for you. Ashton and Jordan, <laughs> me and Mike, we, we, we're, we're gonna be relentless in our pursuit to get y'all on. And as well, as well as with 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 Catherine as well, because this is the second person that got the stamp. So if two people stamp you. You that that gotta need some. I gotta nah, need some. Uh, trust, trust, trust. Say man. no more. Say no more, man. Well, shoot, man. This has been a dope, a dope time. We've been going for about two hours, man. So I, yeah, I won't. My I bad, won't, bro. Won't, been talking no, no, listen, this, this is great. <laughs> I always love recapping folks' journeys and folks' stories, man. So, um, first of all, you know, I want to give you your flowers, bro. Like I want to say, from the time I first met you in LA, like you know, you were one of the most genuine people that I met while I was out there. Like I said, I met Ashton. I met uh, Daryl from from um, Great Individuals from Clutch. He's, he's another one you got it, bruh. I'm he's, working on him. I'm working on him. That man is a, le- that's a living, le- young living legend, bro. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Though I met I met a bunch of folks out there, man. But I remember when we first interacted, man. You were one of the most down to earth people, you know, that I was able to meet. Um, and since then, I've obviously been able to stay in contact and just follow your journey, man. I really appreciate your work. I love seeing um, brothers being able to get into this space and excel at a high level. And also former hoopers, you know what I'm saying? I think that um actually not even former. You're 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 once you're a hooper, you're always a hooper. So yeah, seeing hoopers yeah. be able to be in this space um and excel in that next career, man, is something that is not easy. So I want to definitely give you you your your flowers for that. Um and being able to kind of set the blueprint for what life can be like as an overseas guy, especially, man. It's a little bit easier, I feel like, when you're in the league and you got all those connections getting to that next career. But as an overseas guy, being able to pivot into the next career. Um, I just want to let you know, man, you're killing the game and providing a lot of inspiration for a lot of folks out there, man. So definitely got to let you know that for sure, man. And thank you for coming on today. We really appreciate you, man. This has been an honor and a pleasure, man. Like I said, this won't be the last time we're going we're gonna to have you on because we're going to spend the block, you know, saying this to see what you're up to in a few years. Say, say less. Let's speak that into existence, man. It's truly, it's, it's a pleasure to, to be on the pod, man. I don't take opportunities like this lightly. Um, super, super grateful, man. Like, I really appreciate anybody having any type of interest in, in my story, you know, because I, man, we we cut it at two hours, but there, bro, I cut out of, I want to say about four or five countries. 
right, <laughs> so there, right. there's a there's a whole a whole a whole lot bro but again man i'm just i'm grateful and i really appreciate that and especially to be deemed an inspiration man that that really means a lot because i feel like the highest human act man is to to inspire and if i could be a beacon of light for anybody out there man like i would i'm i'm just grateful to to be able to be that so 100 percent, 100 percent, man well Thank you for your time, man. We're definitely gonna. I I, I know that if the if the people, if the audience, if y'all have sat through this whole two hours, man, go ahead and tap that subscribe button. Give us a thumbs up. Um, like I said, man, I'm I'm loving this creator series that we're we're deep into right now, getting to hear these stories. We've got some more coming up on the way, so make sure you guys subscribe. Uh, Apple, Spotify, Google, wherever you're hearing this, YouTube, of course, it goes a long way. This has been another episode of the What's In Your Bag podcast presented by Bet Online. Till next time, folks. Peace. Suave. 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 I've been in my bag for a while. I'm invincible. Story of a young boss grinding shit critical. Calling on my bros one time because you're special. I had some who dreams of right rounds for my mentor. Every target that I shoot is on point like a pencil. Different road change relationships. I'm so sorry. Came up from the trenches and I made it. I say hardly. Now